broadcasting live from Fox Field on the campus of the University of Lynchburg. It's time for some baseball between the Hornets and the captains of CNU. It's a ranked matchup. CNU enters at 24 and six, Lynchburg 17 and three. So we got a real doozy of a ball game we're looking forward to. Kyle Haney hanging out with Evan Gates. And Evan, you got to see the game yesterday. Lynchburg gets another home win. And they're back at Fox Field again today. You could argue stiffer competition, I guess, here with the CNU captains coming to town. Absolutely, Kyle. We know the program that CNU has and the talent that they bring to the table and not getting a lot of conference matchups throughout the season. We know they're in the Coast to Coast Conference playing some of these ODAC teams. It's going to be a very important matchup against the Hornets. But like you said, yesterday's game for Lynchburg, Wes Arrington, a very solid outing going five innings, getting the win. I think you build momentum as you go into this matchup against a very good team in yeah. CNU. Yeah, confidence is high. Momentum is building. Uh, Lynchburg now 7-1 and one in the ODAC Conference. Uh, and these two teams have met once already this season. Christopher Newport beat Lynchburg 6-4. to four. That was back on March 7th. So maybe the revenge factor in play a little bit. I don't know how much that happens in baseball, Evan, just because you play 40 games you're kind of moving on pretty quick from all those wins and losses. But I'm sure Lynchburg's got that in the back of their mind that, hey, we'd like to avenge that defeat that came just about a month ago. You know they want to win this one, especially after having three errors in that ball game, something that maybe if you clean those up, you have a different result. But like we said, lots of games in the season, you have to come out and play no matter who's on the other side. So it's going to be an exciting one here at James C. Fox Field. So many great individuals to talk about in this one, Evan, but for Lynchburg, we're always talking about Avery Neves. He's a two-time All-American. He's got Benny Bombs, Ben Jones, hip nipping on his heels with the power game. Uh, we're getting to see so much talent on the field for Lynchburg. Christopher Newport's gonna be the same way. They've got guys that are lighting it up, and it'll be interesting to see how the pitchers attack all these great hitters. Well, in a lineup like this, like you said, talent on both sides of the game, pitching and hitting. Avery Neves is one of those guys. I think he fills the stat sheet so well that columns can at times be ignored or not have enough an attention brought to them. We talked earlier before the game, 12 stolen bases. He leads the team. He's trying to write history really in this Hornets program. And I think getting around the bases today for the Hornets could pay dividends. Well, good point. I think sometimes base running is an afterthought, but in a tight game, we think this one will be. Last time they met, it was close. I think you make a great point there. Base running could be key. So we'll see how it goes. We're going to step aside for the national anthem. Then we're back with the first pitch between Christopher Newport and the University of Lynchburg. You're going to see it live on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. Think a private education is too expensive? Think again. At the University of Lynchburg, you can get a personalized education for the cost of a state school. If you're commuting and you get our top scholarships, you could pay much less. And you get all that without the hassle of giant lecture halls. Our faculty know your name here and do more than just teach. You might even do research together and plan out your next career moves. We're almost set for the first pitch here between Christopher Newport and the University of Lynchburg. I'm Kyle Haney. 
Evan Gates, my tag team partner, coming off the top rope. What a day to play, too, Evan. Oh, it's going to be. weather. It's absolutely perfect. And for Lynchburg, as we've said all season, Virginia, you never know what you're going right. to get out there. So they have 60 and sun in the sky. That's something you have to like. And the flag is somewhat limp right now. Usually it's high winds down here at Fox Field. At least that's the way it's been this season. So to see that flag not blowing is a bit of a change. We'll keep an eye on the wind, of course. We'll keep an eye on this man on your screen right now. It's Josh Jorman, second start of the season for Lynchburg. He started two weeks ago in a non-conference game against Greensboro and pitched pretty effectively. But if you look at the stat sheet, Evan, Jorman is not going to be at the top of the standings as far as innings pitched. This is just his second appearance of the season. Nothing out of the bullpen. It's been two starts now. It will be two starts once the game gets underway. So that's a bit of a wild card for Lynchburg. And I think they really like their chances with Jormand on the mound. And I, you got to assume you're going to see a lot of work from the bullpen, maybe from both teams, because it's a busy part of the year. Lynchburg will play a doubleheader, scheduled to play a doubleheader at home on Saturday. And with this being game four in four days, it was a double dip against Washington and Lee Sunday. The game yesterday against Hampton Sydney, all three of those victories. But it's four in four days, so that becomes a key. How do you, how do you manage those arms? How do you get through the innings? And hopefully, how do you get through the innings effectively? Well, you have to wonder, too. We saw the performance from Jack Batchmore yesterday. Got the save and over three innings. That's a solid performance. So we wonder if he'll come into the game. But being a midweek matchup and starting Jormand, I think might be the right look because especially for Lucas Jones, CNU hasn't been able to see much about Jorman this season with that one start, so you don't know what you're going to get in the top of the lineup as we see the captains coming up to plate, so it's going to be interesting to see how the matchup shapes. It shapes sure out. is, it, and it, that's an also an excellent observation. You throw a guy out there that doesn't have a lot of work, so maybe you don't have the same game plan against somebody like Josh Jorman. You see that he's a left-hander facing one of four lefties in the lineup for CNU, this is Scott Crossan, the DH, who will swing on the first one and foul it back. CNU ranked 12 in the nation, Lynchburg 11. So it's not a final exam or anything like that, Evan, but it feels like a pretty stiff midterm here for both these ball clubs. Well, looking just at the stat sheet, too, you're not going to find much discrepancy. Obviously, two solid ball clubs. They're going to come out. They're going to have consistency throughout the lineup. So it's really about coming out about pitching well, staying patient in the box, and obviously being the game that it is with baseball, you know it's going to be a different matchup every single day of the week. Jorman came in with a breaking ball there for strike two. One, two, the count on cross, and nobody away. Lynchburg in the home reds here. Got the white pants. Christopher Newport going with their road black jerseys. Got the blue trim, gray pants. Christopher Newport from Newport News, Virginia, and really one of the all-time great baseball programs is cross and drives this one to right, but the grab is made there by Logan Webster. One away, uh, as that ball was getting hit, Evan, I was thinking about Coach John Harvell for Christopher Newport, 20 plus seasons, three trips to the College World Series. I think it's seven NCAA tournaments total for Christopher Newport, and uh, he's just one of the all-time best. He's been hanging around in the game for a while and is really a great coach. Well, we know how good his resume is, over 500 wins as well, but you think he has the trust of this ball club, being around as long as he has had an impact for these guys, and I think that coming out onto the field, you really see that with the captains. No doubt about it. That's ball one there from Jorman, working exclusively from the stretch position there, the set. Here's another one, not hit hard, but it'll loop over Brandon Garcia's head, who is back in the lineup for Lynchburg, that's good to see and worth noting there. Brandon Garcia missed the better part of the month of March with a leg injury, uh, but in the games that he has played, he's been an impact player. Brandon Garcia, great defense at shortstop, and actually he's got a, a weird hit streak going, Evan, that despite not playing for three weeks, those last three games that he played, it was three, three hit games in a row. So I don't know if it still means that Brandon Garcia is hot or you're on a hit streak when you have to wait basically a month to get back in the lineup. But you did get to see uh, Garcia for a defensive inning yesterday. So nice for him to run around on that leg, and hopefully it's back to 100%. Well, he's one of those freshmen as well. He's just so strong in the field. And even for a fielder to be able to feel his impact, that's something that's important because a lot of times you're standing out there for the game trying to 
make contributions, but at that shortstop position, he's been phenomenal getting around the field. Double play combo is another freshman, and they're actually high school teammates. The one I call Benny Bombs, Ben Jones. He's doing it with the glove and the bat as well. Josh Jorman's got a 2-1 count on the three-hole hitter, Zach Jarnowski. He's got great numbers. He's a transfer, played at UMBC last year, and he's automatically, or already, rather, making an impact. Jorman's got a pick. Oh, but they can't handle it at first. Ball gets by Eric Hyatt. Runner will not be able to advance. Are they going to call it a balk, maybe? I think they called it a balk, and the runner will go to second now. That's Josh Reinholdt that singled the left. Now he's on second. Jorman had the pick. Coach Lucas Jones is going to have a conversation with the field umpire and ask him exactly what happened there. Very short conversation, and it looks like Reinhold will get to stay at second. So an interesting play there. Those lefties with their pickoff moves are always scrutinized as far as the legality of it, but it was a very good one from Josh Jorman. He had Reinhold picked, but unfortunately it ends up being a balk. Well, balks... One of the most technical parts of the game, like you said, with lefty pitchers, you have to have it perfect if you're going to go over to first. Now a runner on second. Ball in the dirt. Nice stop by Sean Pokorak, who is the battery mate of Josh Jorman today. So it's a little bit of a different lineup. It's always been a different lineup. Lynchburg has used a different lineup, actually, in every single game this season. Now there's some constants. Avery Neves, obviously. Gavin Collins has been in the lineup every game. Uh, Carson Atkins, another guy that has started and hit every game, but there's been a lot of changes. Nice breaking ball there across for a strike from Jorman. The count is now full to a dangerous hitter, Zach Jarnowski. Talk about batting, his average at 373. He started all 24 games that he's been a part of. He knows how to get on base. Away target here for Jorman. Ball is down. It was a long hold there on the frame from Pokerak, but it ends up being ball four. So runners at first and second here. Top of the first, two ranked teams. It's number 11 Lynchburg hosting number 12 Christopher Newport. I know we got a lot of just straight up baseball fans watching this one today, Evan, in addition to the Hornets and Captains fans as well. So we welcome everybody to the broadcast. We got a full crew. I mean, it is a full house. Crowd is uh, not the biggest we've seen this season but I think it should build a little bit as the day goes on. Jorman will turn and keep an eye on Reinhold at second, and the hitter is Justin Bowers. We know, too, on a Wednesday afternoon, people still finishing up classes or teaching classes, and so hopefully we'll see a little bit more of a crowd as this game goes on. We know lots of Hornets fans enthusiastic about what this program has been able to do this season. 17 and three thus far, seven and one in the ODAC. They've got four wins in a row. Lynchburg's won nine of their last 10, and they're nine and zero oh at home, undefeated at Fox this season. And that record at Fox in the last four or five seasons is pretty good. Formidable at Fox, to say the least, as Josh Jorman will get strike one across there. Evens the count at one and one. There is one out in the top of the first. Bowers. 23 RBIs on the season. Already have a runner in scoring position, so if you're Jorman, have to keep the heart rate under control. Chance for two. Jones to Garcia. The high school teammates combine for the double play. How about that? Tic-tac-toe across the diamond for Lynchburg, and the inning is done. CNU strands none. They got one hit, and no runs come across. We head to the bottom of the first inning from Fox Field on the campus of the University of Lynchburg. Want to have some outdoor adventures while getting a degree at the same time? At the University of Lynchburg, we have an on-campus zip line room. Plus, we offer adventure trips that cost less than a cup of coffee. And did I mention our beautiful scenery? We're a university for students looking for something more than just books. Welcome to your new adventure experience. When creating a sustainable future, your choices matter, even your choice of a college. The University of Lynchburg is the first college in Virginia to go carbon neutral. Our dining hall is green restaurant certified. We compost all of our food waste and purchase our electricity from landfill gas. 
Now we're turning a hazardous lake into a thriving urban wetland. When you choose Lynchburg, you leave a smaller footprint while building a better tomorrow. Lynchburg is all about you, your ideas, and your goals. We've got one professor for every 10 students, so you can get all the support you need. In the classroom, in the lab, or in nature, You'll learn by putting yourself out there, and we're right there with you. Some fine early defense from Lynchburg to keep the sheet clean. Still 0-0 as the Hornets come to bat in their half of the first inning. It'll be left-handed leadoff man Brandon Garcia. First time hitting since March 11th, Evan. So great for him just to get back out there. Now he wants to probably make up for some lost time and get on the bag and do some damage. Absolutely, Kyle. And still batting 371, 476 on base percentage. So we know that he's comfortable getting to first. Trying to get some bags as well, but early in this game, it's going to be so important for the Hornets just staying patient in the box, trying to work runners around. Even if it's station to station, you know that it is certainly an efficient way of getting runs across. Brandon Garcia and the middleman combo, Ben Jones, high school teammates. We teased that a little bit. Coach Lucas Jones calls them Batman and Robin because they're best friends and they're, they're really competitive with each other as well. They kind of drive each other to be better. And gosh, I mean, it's hard to imagine two better freshman seasons than Brandon Garcia and Ben Jones, what they have been doing this year. For the boys in red, the Lynchburg Hornets, Garcia fouls one away. It's a one-two count now with nobody out. That one in the other batter's box from Weber who is an innings eater. And I talked about busy schedules, but CNU actually doesn't play next until April 4th. That's on Tuesday. So they should be fully loaded as far as the arms go, and everybody would be available, you think. We know how busy the schedule can be. But as you mentioned with Weber, a very solid season so far, 4-1 and one with a 3.79 ERA. He struck out 54 batters as well. This is a team that strikes out almost 10 per game. Pretty impressive number as a team. Garcia will shoot one of the third baseman. Might have caught it in the air, but he'll throw across anyway in time to get Garcia. So one away here in the bottom of the first. CNU was in action yesterday, like Lynchburg. They got a victory as well, 6-0 against Pfeiffer. Common opponent there. Lynchburg played Pfeiffer a couple weeks ago. And we get to see Eric Hyatt in the starting lineup here, playing first base for Lynchburg. Another one of these different lineup combinations. Coach Jones shared some interesting insight with me on Friday about how they think about the lineup. And, and there are, were a few little secrets in there that I won't reveal. Usually I say anybody watching shouldn't be getting a scouting report from me, but I'll, I'll keep some things to myself. But Eric Hyatt is another one of those guys for Lynchburg. Hasn't started a ton, but very capable. And uh, clearly high confidence with him in the two-hole in this one against a ranked opponent. So much in baseball, more that really meets the eye. With Coach Jones, we know their vision. It's obviously this game, but you're looking forward in the season. And even going into the ODAC tournament later in the season, we know the Hornets will have some formidable opponents. Hyatt will bloop one in front of the center fielder. So there's the first hit of the day for Lynchburg. Eric Hyatt in his third start of the season drops a single, 
And he's on board for the All-American, Avery Neves. You were blown away with his speed yesterday. It's these guys like Neves, they're so good. You said you start looking at the stats and the numbers and you just become even more surprised at the things that he's done and the things he's done in, in basically just three seasons as well. It's really just the consistency too, to be able to come out on the field every day and make a contribution. Talk about the double header that he had, having seven RBIs, yeah. it's unheard of. He was on a real tear here lately. Uh, it's a four game hitting streak. In his last seven games, he's got 13 hits and there's three dingers in there for Avery Neves. And he's got that combination of power and speed. He is second all time here at Lynchburg in stolen bases and he is the all time home run leader here at Lynchburg, 31 in the career. He needs uh, two more runs to tie for the all time run scored lead and he's closing in on the all time RBI spot at Lynchburg as well. So by the time Neves is done, he might have really rewritten the record book, literally and figuratively. You have to think. I don't think you can use an eraser on that. You're going to have <laughs> to get an entire new marker. Right. Start scratching it out. Fire up the printing press when Avery Neves' career is done. One, two count on Mr. Neves right now, one of the all-time best. He'll let that one go up and away. See that good movement from Webby, Weber. We probably need to to give him some uh, some of the spotlight. I mean, a left-hander uses the changeup, has the nice curveball, and the, the fastball's got velocity and movement as well. Neves will swing through that, strike out victim number one of the day, and it's out number two of the inning. To be able to strike out Neves, you have to have some talent on the mound, and like you said, lots of different pitches from Weber as two lefties starting this game. Kind of an exciting interesting storyline to look at and each lineup has not a boatload of lefties but a, a fair share of lefties and here comes one right here number 21 Ben Jones another freshman he has put together an outstanding freshman campaign and he really has only played about 10 games in the freshman season has not been a full-time starter but the bat I think just too good to leave on the bench right now for coach Jones and his coaching staff so Expect to see Jones in there quite a bit. Another breaking ball. Uh, ben Jones got his first at bat back on March 11th. Since then, it's been just a monster season. Hitting 414, four home runs and three doubles. That's just in the last six games. It's been incredible stuff from a freshman, from anybody. He'll rip that one hard right at the center fielder. And the inning is over. So good loud contact from Ben Jones, but it is a fly out. And the first inning is done. 0-0 zero, zero the score here from Fox Field. We're back in just a minute on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. Every great college has a great city. For Lynchburg, we are near urban areas with lots of restaurants, shopping, and events. Plus, we are one of the top schools in the area. Come see for yourself. This is the dough. It's wicked cute. It's always so pretty. of Lynchburg, we've lowered our tuition so you get a better value for a great education. Come see our campus for yourself. Get small classes, nationally recognized mentoring and advising, and a community that has your back every step of the way at the University of Lynchburg. Second inning about to get started here from Fox Field. A great day to play. This spring weather has been overall pretty good. We've had a few nasty days, Evan, but 
it's been very nice, and I, I can't wait for April. I think it's going to be even better. we got a busy month here at Fox. You and I are going to be working together a lot. There's a swing and a foul ball from Alec Riley to begin the inning. But it's baseball season, man. Opening day tomorrow, Major League Baseball. How, how excited are you for that? Oh, it's on tomorrow. My Oakland Athletics going to be on the road against the Angels. Wow. Short-ish trip, anyway, in-state. As Jorman will deal, that one fouled off the leg of Alec Riley. And last time we worked together was a World Baseball Classic that we were discussing. That was a blast. Ten, ten former or current Division Three players in the WBC this year. How cool was that? And we just see the con contributions from so many different nations, too. I think it's pretty special in baseball. We see that more in other sports. Obviously, the World Cup gets a lot of spotlight, but to have the World Baseball Classic and really just the attention it got was pretty special. That was an attention-getting breaking ball from Josh Jorman. Caught Alec Riley looking for the strikeout. First K of the game for Jorman, who has always had good stuff. He doesn't have a long resume pitching-wise here at Lynchburg, but he's always a guy that's worked on the pitching, and he's always that guy that the coaching staff has known was capable and, and just kind of the wild card element that he brings. Um, but, but, I mean, you can just see from the way he's throwing the baseball, clearly Josh Jorman knows exactly what he's doing on the mound. Oh, he's efficient. And like you said, that has to be appealing for a coaching staff to be able to turn to Jorman with so many games this week. Throw another arm out there that, like we mentioned earlier, other teams might not be as familiar with. Missed the target down and in there to Jake Benedict, the center fielder who made a nice grab to end the first inning for the captains from CNU. Christopher Newport, here's a drive to center field that'll stop that point in its tracks and Carson Atkins runs it down. Speaking of elite defenders in center field, pretty easy play there for Carson Atkins for out number two. He makes it look so easy, too. We know the sun can be a factor sometimes as well. Obviously, there's going to be wind if you're down here in Lynchburg. But in the outfield, you have to make that first couple of steps pretty quickly. I think that's one of the things that really separates Atkins from some of the other outfielders. That first step, that read he gets is so good. It's really hard to fool him. Uh, he, he almost plays it like a shortstop out there with the fast twitch and how he's always a step ahead and a step in the right direction. Foul ball there for strike one is Josh Jorman. You mentioned efficiency. I think you nailed it there. He's pounding that zone. He's coming right at hitters. And this is another ball to the outfield that Logan Webster is under. Handled no problem, and it's a fast second inning. No hits, no runs, no errors, none left on for the captains. We'll go to Lynchburg's half of the second in just a moment. We're broadcasting live on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. My name is Alexis Fabula. I major in criminology and I double minor in psychology and criminal forensics. My favorite part about Lynchburg is the friends that I've um, come to have. It's helped me come out of my shell more and it's helped me become the person I am and the student I am. I really enjoyed how small the campus was and I also really enjoy um, how small the class sizes are. It made me feel like I was going to be more engaged than I would at a bigger campus. If someone was on the fence of coming to the University of Lynchburg, I would definitely love to sit down and have a conversation with them because I'm forever grateful that I made this choice. Bottom of the second coming up here, the University of 
Lynchburg Hornets will send Sean Pokorak to the plate. Just the fourth start of the season for Pokorak. Evan, he is one of the catchers for Lynchburg, Holden Fiedler and Riley O'Donovan, the other two guys that do a lot of the work as the backstops. But Pokorak, not a lot of at-bats, but a lot of production in those at-bats. He enters the game hitting 667. And he nearly took that one in the left thigh, but it is just ball one to start the bottom half of the second. You have to think confidence will be a factor as well. This being only his 10th at bat, but he comes in, he knows how to hit it, he's seen it off the bat, trying to have some production today. Look like a change up there from Ryan, or Dylan Weber, excuse me. Dylan Weber, don't know if we want to necessarily call him the ace for CNU, but definitely a workhorse. Jay Cassidy was thought of to be the ace for the captains coming into this uh, and he got the victory against Lynchburg the first time they played but Cassidy actually has only pitched one time since that game with Lynchburg so I think some injury issues there for Cassidy but you got guys like Dylan Weber that have stepped up for the captains who are 24 and 6 on the season so this is game 31 of 40 compare that to Lynchburg 17 and 3 this is game 21 of 40 for the Hornets so basically CNU 10 games ahead in the schedule Pokorak will draw the walk. I mean, I think if it was if a team had played 10 and you hadn't played any games, it might be an advantage there. But I think the fact that Lynchburg's already halfway through the schedule probably doesn't matter that CNU's got 10 more under their belt, right? And it's a little late, too. We know that CNU has a week off coming up, so a little bit of time to start tuning things up. But as we've said, Lynchburg's been pretty busy, but they've still continued the winning ways. Gavin Collins will take strike one at the knee, playing third base today for Lynchburg. Spent a lot of time at shortstop in the, absen in the absence excuse me, of Brandon Garcia. Collins, a former ODAC Rookie of the Year, putting together a really good season quietly. I don't think we've talked about Gavin Collins a ton, but he's hit safely in 16 of 20 games for Lynchburg and a mainstay in that lineup. Very, very solid. I think sometimes forgotten about but uh, he'll, he'll do some things that make sure makes you sure you don't forget about him. Takes strike two there. You see good movement on the fastball from Weber. Now it's a one-two count with nobody out for Gavin Collins. We know he's good in the field as well. Batting 272, being able to come in this lineup. And as you, as you said, just having consistency. I think in baseball that's one of those things that if you can come into the lineup and do it every day, that's something that's pretty important. Swing and a miss there for Collins. Out number one of the inning. Strikeout number two for Dylan Weber. And now Riley O'Donovan. DHing today will be hitting seventh. Power to all fields for Riley O'Donovan. He homered in these two teams' first meeting. That was a 6-4 victory for CNU about a month ago. Happened on March the 7th. O'Donovan also a catcher. So many people on this Lynchburg roster who can play defense behind the plate, and I think for Lucas Jones, that's something that as the season goes on, maybe a little bit more wear and tear, having those options is going to be great for this coaching staff. Two balls, no strikes to Riley O'Donovan. One out, and it's Pokorak, another catcher on first. O'Donovan early on that one as he comes in, off the cap to the backstop. Two one the count for the always dangerous Riley O'Donovan. He's put together a very, very solid career here at Lynchburg. And always so much fun to watch. Plays the game hard, throws it hard, hits it hard. Hit 385 last season. Fastball inner part of the plate there. Evens the count at two and two. Weber set at the waist, ready for the two-strike pitch. Mm, that one nearly hit O'Donovan, gets by the catcher. Jarnowski actually didn't even see it at first, and Pokorak will take a wide turnaround second, but has to hold there. So 90 feet on the advance, and there's a runner in scoring position for the first time for Lynchburg in this one. The guy who's pretty accustomed to driving in runs, Riley O'Donovan. It's a full count, one out. 
you can tell with the way that Pokerak came around second that the Hornets are definitely trying to take every base they can get. It's what you got to do in big matchups like this one. Weber comes across up the middle. Second baseman was shaded there holding on the runner and throws over to first for the second out of the inning. So a little bit of bad luck for O'Donovan. He didn't, he didn't scorch that one, but hit it fairly sharply. The second baseman was just basically playing up the middle. And that brings up Logan Webster, runner on third, two away here for Lynchburg in the bottom half of the second. We know that he's bat clean up most of the season, so he's definitely ready to be in a pressure situation and an early chance here to get a run. Yeah, you gotta like what Logan Webster has done this season. Just a sophomore, another young guy. Gets kind of forgotten about, I think, because there's so many seniors and grad students for Lynchburg. Then you got these fantastic freshmen. I think we sometimes that, you know, you get it's an afterthought with Logan Webster just in his second season, put together a great one. One strike, there's a big, steep breaking ball. It was kind of that Clayton Kershaw-esque curveball there with the 12-6 bite, and now it's an 0-2 count on Webster. You're in the box. How are you timing that one? <laughs> Webster will try it again, and that's hit sharply to the first baseman, and the inning is over. So one left on for Lynchburg. It was no hits, no CNU errors, and we've still got no score here from Fox Field as we head to the top of the third inning. This video isn't about me. It's about the limitless possibilities that the University of Lynchburg allows me to be. An athlete, an artist, an adventurer, a writer, a believer, a human. Because what I love about the University of Lynchburg is that they have a saying, here we're home. And honestly though, I think a better fit would be a home for everyone. Because it doesn't matter the color of your skin, the person you love, the God you pray to, the pronouns you use, the city you're from, the language you speak. University of Lynchburg gives you the greatest opportunity they can for you to be the absolute best version of yourself. Hello, my name is Dr. Sabita Manian. I'm the Associate Dean of the Lynchburg College of Arts and Sciences, in charge of the School of Social Sciences. Did you know that April 7th is Give Day at the University of Lynchburg? On this Give Day, I am committing myself to the Model UN Simulations, also known as the Model United Nations Simulations. And that is because, one, I love the idea that it integrates your learning Christopher Newport up to hit here in the top of the third. Aiden Stufel, the right fielder, hitting 365 on this season. A homer, four doubles. He is one of five full-timers hitting over 300 for Christopher Newport this season. And another lefty to face a left-hander. Josh Jorman still out there for the third inning for Lynchburg. And how about this? Seven stolen bases and eight attempts. So you get them on base, chance to cause some havoc. Gavin Collins, the third baseman for Lynchburg, is in on the grass, so possibly expecting the bunt from the speedy Stufel. That one misses from Jorman, 2-0 the count. Around the infield for Lynchburg, Collins at third, Brandon Garcia short, Ben Jones is the second baseman, and Eric Hyatt at uh, first today for Lynchburg. Outfield's been one that we've seen a lot of. Avery Neves in left, Carson Atkins center, and Logan Webster in right. That's been pretty well set. We've seen Jackson Harding play quite a bit of right field. Avery Neve has played some first base this year. But for the most part, that, that trio in the outfield, pretty locked in. There's a dive from Ben Jones, but can't get the leather on it as that one bounces through the hole and Stufel is on with the single. Second hit of the game for Christopher Newport. Good work of just being patient. Again, not every big play in a ball game is going to be flashy or home run, but like we said earlier, get on base. Now cause Jorman to have to look back to first. Did have that balk on the pickoff attempt in the first inning. Ended up not burning Lynchburg too bad. Benedict shows bunt. I was just going to ask you about your theory on the sacrifice bunt with the runner on first. We know it's the speedy Stufel. 
So there's a couple ways to think about that. If you get him to second, he should be a likely candidate to score on a base hit. But the other school of thought is maybe just let him try to steal his way to second. They will bunt. Jorman off the mound nicely. Underhand flip to first. And there is one gone in the top of the third inning. And we know every college baseball coach is going to have their own take on that. And obviously bunting one of those things where you have to know your lineup. But I think now with the leadoff hitter coming up, at least you still have an opportunity for some contributions and a runner on second. Well, it makes a lot of sense from that standpoint. Get your, get your leadoff man a look with a runner in scoring position. And with one out, you should theoretically have two chances to drive in this opening run. Scott Crossan flew out to right in his first at bat. He fouls off the first offering this time from Josh Jorman. One out here in the top of the third. A sunny day at Fox Field. Not much wind today. Fans seem to be enjoying themselves already. Scoreless between two ranked ball clubs. That one up and in. Nearly hit Crossan, but it's just a ball. 1-1 one, one the count. Talk about these captains at the top of the lineup. Three people who are batting over 360. So they know how to get on base and make some loud contact. Off speed pitch that Crossan did not get all of. Avery Neves is in position under it. Makes the grab for out number two. So Josh Reinholdt, one of those guys you just mentioned. He has a single in this ball game. Base open. Not so sure you want to face Zach Jarnowski with, with two on, but uh, maybe it does give you some comfort for Jorman knowing that maybe the free pass doesn't kill you with the base open there. Runner on second is Aiden Stufel. He led off the inning with a single. Big chance here for Jorman to get the out and force Jarnowski to lead off in this next inning. Not have anybody on base for him to drive in. Jorman looks in for the sign. Infield is regular depth. In fact, maybe a little bit deeper at the corners than normal. There's one that just missed the edge from Jorman, and now it's a 2-0 count. Now your pitch calling may factor in the fact that there is a base open. And if you're Josh Jorman, obviously you'd like to get one across for a strike here, but you don't want it to be too good to Josh Reinhold. Reinhold with the open stance. He'll swing on that one. It appeared to be an off-speed pitch. He was out front, and he shot it down. Foul there against the tarp in the deep corner. 2-1 now with two gone in the top of the third. And Kyle, like you said, just thinking about which pitch to throw, sometimes a bad pitch is better than one that's going to be hit to the wall. So you have to know your stuff. Another big pitch for Jorman. He's set and ready to work. Checks that runner one time. That's Stufel at second. Nobody holding him too close out there for Lynchburg. We mentioned Stufel is a running threat. You don't typically see the steal of third with two outs. I guess the conventional wisdom says you're already in scoring position, so don't take a chance. But if Stufel gets the opportunity to wander off, I'm sure he would take the swipe there if he could. It's a 2-2 count now after a couple really good pitches from Jorman. See if he can make a third one in a row. Two gone in the third. Breaking ball. Garcia's got it. He'll fire across. Hustle down the line. The ball got away, and the runner's going to score. It was a short hop throw from Brandon Garcia. Eric Hyatt tried to swipe it out of the dirt, and not only was the runner safe, but the ball got by Hyatt. And the run comes in. So it's a 1-0 Christopher Newport lead. And what's probably going to be an infield single and then an error to go along with it to let Stufel come around and score. Well, Garcia knew it was going to have to be a quick throw over to first. Nice speed from Reinhold, but as second base will be stolen, now you really just have to be able to get past that play, it's a long ball game, only one run, but early innings, you can't allow it to become more. Part of that even keel mentality that coaches talk about all the time, just one run. Never like to see that baseball rolling around free like it has on back-to-back -back plays here for Lynchburg, that ball getting by Pokerak, not really getting by him, just kicked away and far enough for the runner 
Reinhold to advance. This is Zach Jarnowski walked in his first at bat. It's 2-0 count now for the very dangerous sophomore. Had quite a good stat line for UMBC last year and has transferred to Christopher Newport. He'll swing at that breaking ball and miss. 2-1 the count. Infield pretty deep again. Those corners are shaded towards the line. Outfield is regular depth. Carson Atkins, the center fielder, shaded slightly to pull. That one in, just missed right there between the batter's box line and home plate. It's a 3 1 count now for Jarnowski. Mentioned his stint with UMBC. He's just a sophomore, too, with the numbers he's putting up. So impressive for a captain's lineup. Also has a lot of experience. Out front of another off speed pitch. You can see that trend. Jorman really relying on the off speed stuff. It's not uh, it's not quite slow, slower, and slowest for Josh Jorman, but he's clearly comfortable throwing those breaking balls and change ups across the plate for a strike, and it appears to be keeping the captains off balance for the most part. Payoff pitch here with two outs and a runner on second. That one will get lifted over Wake Fieldhouse, and we'll try it again here. Another full count delivery coming up. Especially not having as many pitching appearances this season. If you're Jorman, you just have to throw what you're confident in because while it's only the third inning, you want to be able to bite into this ball game. The way he throws it against a ranked team like Christopher Newport, you'd think Josh Jorman's pitching every weekend. There's another breaking ball, rolled foul. But he just looks really, really comfortable and composed out there to me. You wouldn't know that it's only appearance number two of the season, would you? Absolutely not. And you mentioned his demeanor, just being able to be calm. This is a ranked matchup within the top 15. Still looking confident, though, is Jorman. Another full count delivery coming up here to Jarnowski. Looked like another breaking ball. And it comes in over the top of the zone for ball four. Not a bad pitch, though, from Josh Jorman. And again, base open. That's the second walk of the day for Zach Jarnowski. We are in the top of the third, and here comes Justin Bowers. Hit into that 4-6-3 double play to end the first inning. See if Jorman can induce another ground ball here to end the third frame, top of the third. Bowers has been a part of all but one game for the captains. He's used to being in this lineup. Swings on that one. Looked like he got it off the handle. And it's a no one count. Jorman is throwing a lot of strikes, though. I, I, and as I say that, I know he's walked Jarnowski twice. Those are the only two walks of the game so far for Josh Jorman. But even the balls have been very competitive right around the zone. And he may have actually hit his spot on those pitches, too. That one's in the dirt for ball one. That's the other thing I think you touched on. It Sometimes looks can be deceiving. You get a walk, it might be you're pitching around a guy, or it might be, hey, I hit exactly the target I wanted to, and I didn't get the call, so we're moving on to the next batter. Well, Jarnowski doesn't exactly make things easy. Right. Saw him fouling off a few, just staying in the box. Yeah, that was a pretty good at bat from Jarnowski. Probably didn't give that full credit myself. There's strike two for Josh Jorman. And now it's a one-two count on Justin Bowers. Two outs, runners on first and second. See if Jorman can get off the mound here. Pulled to Collins at third. He'll go the short way to second. Throw pulled Ben Jones a bit, but he kept the foot on the bag for out number three. So Christopher Newport scores one, two hits, two left on. No, at one Lynchburg error, I beg your pardon. We head to the bottom of the third inning. CNU leading Lynchburg 1 0. The students learning by bringing together textbook with practice. And second, it really embodies the Lynchburg learning experience. So join me on this give day 
because no gift is too small. Contribute in any way to someone you wish to honor or something that you wish to honor at this Lynchburg campus. Thank you and spread the word. Carson Atkins leads off for the University of Lynchburg. 9-1-2 due up for the Hornets in the bottom of the third. They find themselves trailing for the first time as CNU gets a run across. It was an interesting inning, Evan. I, I, again, I, you can't feel terrible about it if you're Lynchburg um, because it's just a one run, no crooked numbers there. You'd like to see a little bit cleaner defense, but in the end, it's a 1-0 lead for CNU. We'll see how long it lasts. We saw a couple throws that got away, but overall, it doesn't look like this Hornets team is concerned. They've really, ent the entire season, we haven't seen a whole lot of scoring early in games. So we know that as the pressure heats up, they're going to be ready to deliver. I was looking at CNU's numbers. Their, their first inning is actually their highest scoring inning for the captains, over 40 runs in that first this season, and then it kind of goes down from there, which I guess makes sense. You got your leadoff hitters up. I mean, you got it's the only inning where you're guaranteed to have one, two, and three up, that leadoff inning. And I think you would imagine that those are going to be your best three hitters. So maybe, maybe we should look at everybody's first inning scoring numbers. Maybe the first inning is the highest scoring inning for every baseball team. I just think sometimes you're facing that starter who's locked in and you haven't really got a, a read on him. So it did kind of surprise me a little bit as Atkins watches that one go for a ball. 2-2 two, two the count. I mean, what's your take on that? What would you think would be a baseball team's highest scoring inning if you had to pick one? Well, that can definitely be a trend. And we know that for the captains, you might see a few substitutions late in ball games too early in the season. So as you said, 1-2-3 do up, hitting over 360 as we said. I'd like to think that they're going to go out and their bats are going to be ready, but – I think that's a stat that would be different for every ball club. Yeah, yeah, we need to get the LHSN research department on that one to, to figure that out. And uh, maybe maybe we'll talk about that on Saturday as Carson Atkins draws a walk. He's on. He's been swinging a hot bat lately. Carson Atkins has hit safely in eight of the last nine. I think that gets a on-base streak in 10 of the last 11 now for Carson Atkins. He's aboard with nobody out for the leadoff man. Brandon Garcia hit a shot to the third baseman in his first appearance. First at bat since March 11th for Brandon Garcia. But now he's in there for the second one and takes ball one. And it's good now for Garcia. You got that first at bat over with. Obviously, he still looks very composed in the box, but just starting to feel it again. I think he's hit in some inner squad scrimmage stuff for Lynchburg as Atkins kind of bluffed to steal there and now it's a 2-0 count as Weber misses high. That's one good thing. The great coaches will find a way to get you some reps, Evan. If you got a guy with the leg injury, you have him hit in the inner squad against live pitching, you just tell him not to run to first. So you get some live at bats that way. You can do those things. There's a pickoff move from Dylan Weber. I don't think that was Weber's best. That one kind of deliberate maybe setting up another move possibly to try to pick Atkins off. That's always fun to watch how those lefties hold runners. I've already seen a little bit of that today with Josh Jorman. 2-0 count here for Brandon Garcia. That one nowhere close. And now it's three balls and no strikes to the leadoff man for Lynchburg. Nobody out here in the bottom of the third. For pitchers with pickoff moves, particularly left-handed ones, 
we see lots of pitchers who can be more crafty and then ones that are just really good at executing. There's we another see one. Another of those one. Moves. Yep. Took the words right out of my mouth, Evan. Yeah, to me, I think he I think Weber's got a better move than that. I think that's kind of that token. I'll show you this move and save my really good one for later. But it's a 3-0 count, so I think Weber's got his full attention on the batter. Maybe not, as it's ball four. Two of those pitches really weren't close. And here you go. The All-American Avery Neves is up with two on and nobody out. No, it's Eric Hyatt up. I beg your pardon, fans. I got ahead of myself. I saw Neves walking up to the plate there to get the, to get the gear from Brandon Garcia, the leg guard. And it's Eric Hyatt that's up. So well, there Neves you go. is still lurking. Air number you know one coming. for me. Yeah, right. Yeah, he is lurking. Yes, yes. Barring the triple play, I guess. Haven't seen one of those in a while. None this year for Lynchburg. I hope we better knock on wood or something right now. I don't want to absolutely be, be commentators be, curse. Exactly. Yeah, I guess if you're a captain's fan, you would love that right now. But it is Eric Hyatt at the plate, fans. Number five, playing third base. He is one for one in the game. You think sack bunt situation here with the All-American Avery Neves behind, but we'll see what Coach Lucas Jones has in mind. Infield is in double plate depth. First baseman is in on the grass. Third baseman at a 45 degree angle, close to third. Hyatt does show the bunt and takes that one for a ball. That's five balls in a row for Dylan Weber, the lefty from CNU. Saw Weber there with pitch high in the zone. Maybe trying to get Hyatt to pop one up. Have to get that bat over it. Square one away. Bunt on display again, and it's a good one from Hyatt. Great location. He might beat this. How about no throw at all? That is an infield hit for Eric Hyatt. It was clear that CNU's bunt coverage had the pitcher Weber bouncing off to cover the third base line, but the bunt was so perfectly placed. Weber couldn't get there in time. Third baseman. Broke a little bit late. That's Sam Benedict. He had no play at first, and now the bases are loaded for Avery Neves, and you're going to get a mound visit here from the captains. A little timeout as Avery Neves. You said he was lurking. He was waiting, and now he's here. We get to see him with the bases loaded. It's going to be very interesting to see what he does in this at bat. We know the green light is going to be there, but with bases loaded and no outs, so many opportunities. If he can get one clean. This is a, a guy like Avery Neves' dream right here to come up with nobody out, sacks packed, pitcher struggling just a little bit as well. I can't think of a better scenario and a better guy that you would want. He is second all-time in Lynchburg history in runs batted in. Over 160, he'll need 188 to tie Steven Scott, but you think that's got to be in reach before the season ends, and Avery Neves could add a few to the total right here. If you're on the base pads, you have to be ready to run if one gets into the outfield grass. Expect action on every pitch. Neves will watch that breaking ball go in the dirt. Good stop there by Jarnowski to keep that one off the back wall. That's the other thing right now. Defense is pressured. No pass balls, wild pitches if you're Christopher Newport right here. Infield double play depth, first baseman playing behind the runner. Carson Atkins is the Lynchburg runner at third. There's a tailing fastball that comes across for a strike. 1-1 one, one the count on Avery Neves. Nobody out, bases loaded, bottom third. Dugouts are getting loud from both sides, trying to rally their troops. Neves will sniff at that, but didn't pull the trigger, and it's a ball. 2-1 the count now. Obviously, if you can get in a hitter's count, that's going to be beneficial, but we know Neves has more than one way of getting on base. Move the runners around. Long look there from Dylan Weber. Now he's set at the belt and ready to go. Fires to Neves, swings through that one. Strike two. 2-2 two, two the count. Avery Neves did strike out in his first at bat. So maybe some confidence there for Dylan Weber. Knowing you got the K the first time the danger man came up. Number 30's got another chance here. 2-2. Two, two. Nobody out. Base is loaded in the bottom 
of the third inning. Lynchburg down 1-0, maybe not for long. Another one that Neves thought about but didn't fish, and now it's a full count. Walk would be an RBI. It's a nice take. You know he wants to swing the bat here, as you said. This is a dream situation if you're Neves. Hits out of that crouch. It's not the deep Jeff Bagwell full parallel squat, but it's a crouch there from Neves. Ball four. That fastball came in up. Looked like it had some extra zip on it from Weber, but missed the target. It's ball four. First run across for Lynchburg is Carson Atkins, and we are tied 1-1. And you get rid of an All-American here at the plate, but Ben Jones is right behind him, and now you don't even have an out to record. So if you're seeing you, you really have to buckle down in the field. Like you said, no pass balls. But ben Jones has been swinging the bat. Slugging Amazing. over 900 on the season. Benny Bomb. Seems like every out that he hits is deep and it drives the outfielders back. He'll take that breaking ball for a strike. 0-1 the count. Still nobody out. Ben Jones in his last six has 10 hits, Evan, and seven of them are extra base hits. Four homers and three doubles. How about that More. homer yesterday? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it was fun for you. It was fun for everybody. Weber set again, ready to pitch to Jones. Hits it hard right side, but it's a foul ball. 0-2 the count now on Ben Jones. 0-2 count here. You just have to be patient. Obviously, Weber can't necessarily waste a pitch too much that gets past the catcher. We know Jarnowski's done a nice job so far behind the plate. Got to trust your catcher if you want to get nasty here with a breaking ball in the dirt that he's going to smother it and keep it in front. First base occupied less than two outs, so you won't need to worry about a drop third strike situation either. That one's just away for a ball. One, two, nobody out. Base is loaded for the freshman, Ben Jones. Garcia's at third. Hyatt put down the nice bunt. He stands at second in your picture there. And Avery Neves leading off at first. Weber went with the curve ball, and Jones got enough of it to foul it away. Jones nodding a little bit. You have to think he feels confident with what he's been able to do as of late. Outfield appears to be regular depth with the power man, the freshman Ben Jones. He'll roll this one to first. First baseman bobbled it. No out there, and now the ball's gotten away. One run is in, and a second run will come in. Hornets lead three to one. Garcia was going to score anyway, as the first baseman, Justin Bowers, had to range in the hole to his glove side. He juggled the ball and then tried a little jump throw to Weber, who was covering first as a pitcher. But the throw was off target. It ends up hitting the screen in front of CNU's bench. Here's a great second look at it. The throw was really nowhere close. By the time Weber got to it, Hyatt was in home with a feet first slide. And that's a big play for Lynchburg to come across. They lead three to one, and there is still no outs in the third inning. And a play like that, your mind's in a million places if you're the defense. Hornets do a great job of having some heads up base running, adding two to the score tally. Oh, wow. There's a hit by pitch. Pokerak never even thought about moving as that one comes in and hits him in the lower leg. And now it's bases loaded again with nobody out. I think you're going to see some activity in the Christopher Newport bullpen pretty soon. You'd have to think. And even though we know that Weber's an inning eater, you have a week until your next ball game. So really the entire pen is available other than what you've seen the last couple of games. 3-1 game now, Lynchburg leading by two, looking for more. Bases loaded for Gavin Collins. Nobody out. That one was low and in, but just a ball. The inning has been a pair of walks, a bunt hit from Hyatt that was supposed to just be a sacrifice bunt, another walk, error by the first baseman, and then a hit by pitch. No outs recorded yet for CNU. And think about this, Evan. The ball hasn't left the infield. It's three runs for Lynchburg. They haven't even got a ball out of the infield yet. 
You're exactly right. This is a team that has the firepower to do so, but we've mentioned it all season, so many ways to get runs in. 3-0 count now on Gavin Collins. Yeah, Weber normally composed, but I think even now the situation's getting to him. He hasn't completely lost it out there, but he is struggling at the moment. See if Gavin Collins has got the green light here, 3-0. Wouldn't have mattered, that one almost hit him anyway. Instead, it's ball four, fourth walk of the inning for Dylan Weber. And you have to think, captain's coaching staff maybe has seen enough. Four walks in an inning. There's patience, but, but even that patience has a limit, Evan. Four walks in the inning, and don't forget Weber has hit a batter as well. We see action in that pin, and like you said, in a ranked matchup, you can't wait too long. 4-1 the score. Gavin Collins will get an RBI on the walk. It's a four-pitch walk. That's the other thing for Weber. There's been some of these walks where it's a four-pitch walk and some of the pitches aren't close. He's struggling at the moment. You got to feel for him. That spotlight is very bright out there on the mound. We'll see what kind of pitch he can make here. 1-0 count on Riley O'Donovan. There's another one. Six balls in a row. Like you said, it can be incredibly lonely out there. Something we mentioned earlier in the season, the pitcher is really the only player on the field that has the ball every single pitch or play or whatever you want to call it in sports terms. So yeah. it's really nothing like it in sports, really. Umpire is umpire is going to tell us that the count is 2-1 now. 2-1, so scratch what I said about seven balls in a row for Dylan Weber. 2-1 count now for Riley O'Donovan. There's a good sharp breaking ball that's in for a strike. Evens the count at 2-2. Two, two. Still nobody out. Yeah, you got to feel for Weber. I mean, I've done it. I've pitched. It is not easy. And when you're struggling, that is the loneliest place in the world with everybody watching you on that dirt circle there. Oh, Donovan shoots this one over the shortstop's head. Another run will come in. Runner on the move at third. No play at home. And Lynchburg has broken the door off the hinges in the bottom of the third. It's a 5-1 Hornet lead, and there's still nobody out. How about that? Six runs in the inning now. Everybody in that dugout stepping up to the plate with confidence. 6-1, the Lynchburg lead. They're scoring so many runs, it's hard to keep track. The inning is not over. Nobody out. And that's, that's interesting. Even though Lynchburg scored all these runs, it still becomes that sacrifice bunt situation again for the Hornets with runners on first and second, nobody out. We had this already in the inning. It seems like it was 20 or 30 minutes ago, but here's this situation again. And if you're Lynchburg, why not put some extra pressure on the CNU defense? Swing and a miss there from Logan Webster. Sometimes just showing bunt, two on that first pitch, making him think a little bit. But like you said, you can't play to the score line. You have to be able to look at the situation, and we know runners on first and second have to advance them any way you can. Everybody's reached in this inning. That streak may end here. They get Oh, safe at second. Oh, and then the umpire will say that the shortstop went back and got the bag in time. That was Josh Reinholdt made the initial catch. The first call was safe, and then Reinholdt was able to just poke the foot back there at second to get the force there, and O'Donovan is the first out of the inning, and here we go. Lynchburg is batted around with Carson Atkins hitting. One away, six to one the lead, and here comes probably the change for Christopher Newport. Wow, what an offensive explosion for the University of Lynchburg. Talk about this inning, batting around already with Atkins coming up, and you know, in a situation like that, you can't get comfortable, really, if you're either team, because the Hornets want to keep the scoring going. But if CNU wants to stay in this ball game, you have to start chipping away these next few innings when you get back up to bat. Situation was still lots of pressure on the captains. For Dylan Weber, the official line looks like it's going to be two and one third innings. He gave up three hits. He walked. Walked five, and four of those walks were issued in this inning. 
and one hit batter in there as well. Anytime I give a stat, Evan, it's unofficial. Um, but we do our best. We do our best. And the one great thing is with the technology, you can follow along and get the official stats at lynchburgsports.com, which is a great way to watch a game. I think that's one of the uh, one of the great things about being a sports fan in the modern age is you can get all the stats you want on your smartphone while you watch the game. And it really, to me, it really complements the game. Some people don't like the stats, but I think they're pretty cool. Well, you really get the full package. And we know in baseball, a game that – there are so many so stats many, on the yeah. sheet yeah. to pay attention to. Gives you a little bit of perspective. It does, and that's an interesting thing, too, when you talk to people about baseball, what stats they look at and value more, and that's an interesting coaching aspect as well. Lucas Jones and I were discussing that on Friday night, some of the things that Lynchburg looks at statistically and other things that I would throw out, and he would just kind of shrug the shoulders and say, yeah, we don't, we don't really care about that, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's fun. That's that's a fun part of the game. Not so much fun for Christopher Newport right now as we'll reset the situation. It's a six-run inning for Lynchburg. There is only one out, and the man that led off the inning with a walk, Carson Atkins, is back up to the plate again with runners at the corners. Like you said, still one out. Just have to be smart at the pitches. You go at it, it's going to be a bunt down the first baseline. It'll get the runner in for Atkins. Collins comes in to score. I think it was a safety squeeze kind of a concept there on the bunt. Atkins really did nicely to push it down to first. So an RBI there. And now the leadoff man, Brandon Garcia, will hit with a runner on second. His team now has a six-run lead, 7-1. to one. Two gone, finally two gone here in the bottom of the third. What I find interesting, Kyle, go get the hit column. It's 3-3. Three to three. Score line says much different in terms of runs. We've just seen this Lynchburg squad that's been patient in the box and obviously getting those five walks, a hit batter, that really helps. Lynchburg so patient last year, 294 walks as a team last season. That adds up to or ends up being 6.13 per game. Their, their number on the per game walks is down a little bit this year, but they still take almost five a game. So they have a patient approach. I think Lynchburg led the country in walks back in 2021. So definitely part of the game plan, getting a good pitch to hit, fouling off those pitches. Brandon Garcia will shoot one to left. This should score the runner. Yeah, Webster coming around. No play at home. Garcia was looking to get to second on the double, but had to slam on the brakes. It's just an RBI single and another run on the board for the Hornets. They lead 8-1. to one. Well, I'd say coming back for this one, Garcia continuing to find his stride. It's like every single time that he gets in the box, he just has this belief that he can make something happen. And as we've seen from all the Hornets today, they're lighting up the score sheet. Eric Hyatt is lighting things up. He is two for two, including that bunt single in this inning. Was probably supposed to be a straight up sacrifice bunt, but perfect placement, good speed. Got Hyatt to first with the single. He has scored in this inning. And he's looked at, looking to continue a perfect day. Two outs, 1-0 the count. Brandon Garcia, good wheels, base stealing threat over there at first. As we see a throw over from the captains. You talk about momentum, too. I think that bunt really started things. We know there were back-to-back -back walks, but get the bunt down. Bases loaded for Neves with no outs. Really good situation there. It looks like for a second they thought the pitch hit him. Umpire is going to come out and talk to the field ump. Going to be a conversation here with the or by the officials. Eric Hyatt certainly thought he got hit, and obviously – Christopher Newport disagrees. We're going to get another good look at it. Yeah, it, it looked like it hit Hyatt right there on the belt where he's got that wristband, the play sheet. And mm, they're going to send Hyatt back. Maybe it got him on the elbows, what he's indicating. I, I guess the only other question you could be asking, Evan, was did he swing? And certainly from that replay, he did not offer at that pitch. There was no swing. Uh Obviously, the umpires don't have the benefit of instant replay replay like we do. But Eric Hyatt 
will come back in the box. He has a conversation with Lucas Jones there. And now Coach Jones is uh, Coach Jones is telling the umpire to look at the elbow. He's hey, he's having the umpire look at the elbow to show him where it hit him. And I don't know again if the discussion is whether or not the ball hit Eric Hyatt. It looks like the mark left on the elbow clearly indicates that it did. And from our perspective, Evan, it, it, he didn't go around, so you don't have a swing. So it should be a hit batter. I mean, it should be a hit by pitch right here. Like you said, my initial thought was there was no swing, but it's hard to ignore. Yeah, there, there's, the, there's the other look there. Uh, I, guess, I guess, you know, the other one is maybe the umpire thought it hit the knob of the bat. That didn't happen either. You could clearly see the ball change directions on your replay. But the play is over. And now Eric Hyatt has a chance to maybe get a hit and continue his perfect days. Already two for two. Certainly should have some motivation here, you would think. One, two count. Garcia fakes the steal. And that one, Hyatt, will foul off. Well, if you want anyone stepping back in the box today, it's definitely Hyatt with what he's been able to do in those first two at-bats. Keeping it competitive. Getting in counts, too, I think, as pickoff unsuccessful. For Lynchburg, just getting in hitters counts and then being able to really swing the bat. I mean, that's baseball, obviously, but more so for this Hornets squad as it's sort of the middle of the season, just having that confidence is going to be important. The pitcher is David Gingras. He came in in relief of Dylan Weber. And Gingras trying to get out of the inning. This time Garcia will run. High fastball, good pitch to throw. Garcia slides in, mishandled. He'll scamper to third. And Garcia will get the extra base as the throw ends up in the outfield grass. Good take there by Eric Hyatt as well. I mean, that was close. And now it's a full count with two away here in the bottom of the third, what has been a very long third inning. For a second, if that throw was clean, I wasn't sure if he was going to get there, but not only does he get to second, but he advances to third as well. Hyatt shoots one to center, and it drops in. So there you go. Thought he got hit by a pitch. Doesn't matter. He ends up with his third hit of the ball game. Three hits in three innings for Eric Hyatt. Outstanding stuff. Garcia is pumped. Dugout coming to greet him. What a monster inning from Lynchburg. Contributions all through the lineup. And we get to see Avery Neves again. Nine to one, the Lynchburg lead. This is a third inning that is going to be memorable for different reasons. We talk about Avery Neves named on the D3Baseball.com team of the week. Mm. And he's going to get to go to first. Yeah, hit by pitch. Avery Neves has accumulated a boatload of those in his career as well. It's not the first stat we think of when we talk about Neves, but it certainly doesn't hurt Lynchburg's cause. Ben Jones is back up. 0 for 2 in the ball game. David Gingris now trying to get out of the inning for Christopher Newport. You wonder how much that first game against the captains has stayed fresh in the Hornets' mind. Obviously, it's been some time, play a lot of baseball games, but they've come out firing early on. I think it's a valid statement by you, and obviously you can't get in every player's head. You don't know how much it matters to each guy or to each coach individually. Coaches, again, they try to stay fairly even keel. Don't want to build up any game too much, but you get the, you get the impression that Lynchburg did come out with revenge on their minds, don't you? Absolutely. I mean, if you're not coming out, you want to go win ball games, but to be able to do it handedly and for a ranked squad, we know both of these teams extremely capable of winning, but it's beyond the stat sheet that's really going to matter come tournaments and the postseason. Could be a statement kind of a win, a resume building win too for Lynchburg if you're looking for an at-large bid at the end of the season. Ball four there from Gingras. That one was closer than ball three, but it's another walk, and the struggles continue for Christopher Newport. Bases loaded again. I've lost count of how many times Lynchburg has had the bases loaded in this inning. Sean Pokorak is in there again. 
with two outs and a chance to really just continue to throw more fuel on the fire here. Lynchburg still hitting in the bottom of the third. With two outs, to be able to make something happen here, really put the exclamation mark on the inning if it hasn't already happened. See a nine in the score tally. Foul off there by Pokerak. Lynchburg has scored double digit runs, over 10 runs in seven games this season. Evan, they're not there yet. They look like they may get there, but not there yet. They did that 17 times last year as Pokerak swings through that one. One, two the count now with two outs. Bases loaded. Captains can get an out anywhere. And they desperately need one and want one here. Swing and a miss, and the inning is over. Strikeout there, but damage is done for Lynchburg. They score nine in the bottom of the third. They do it in a variety of ways. And we'll catch our breath and try to recap it for you in just a second on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. I was really attracted to Lynchburg primarily because my dad went here. Um, he is an alum, so I kind of had that close tie of being interested in this school. And the school had what I wanted to study. I knew I wanted to help people in the area of health and wellness. So the health promotion program was definitely a program that drew me in. And from day one, I've been in love with it, and I wouldn't have chosen any different. I have never had um, better professors or teachers in my life. And I think here at the University of Lynchburg, the professors definitely care about their students, especially in the health promotion department. These professors want you to be educated, want you to have the experience, and just want you to feel confident going into your career path following your collegiate education. You just feel like you're cared for here and that you matter, and that no matter what, at the end of the day, you're gonna be successful. And the people here really want to be here, and everyone has a purpose, and it's just a great environment to be in. My name is Davion Washington, Jr. I have the honor of serving as the student body president. Let's try to recap that monster inning for the University of Lynchburg. They started the bottom of the third, down one nothing. C CNU scored the opening run of the ball game in the top of the third. Evan, things changed dramatically. It ends up being nine runs, just four hits, there were five walks and two hit batters in there for CNU, a couple errors for the captains as well, and it all adds up to a nine-run inning for Lynchburg. Riley O'Donovan had a big single that drove in two, and then there's RBIs scattered throughout the lineup there, a couple RBIs on bases loaded walks as Dylan Weber lost the zone for Christopher Newport, and then uh, David Gingras ended up relieving him and was able to get out of the inning, but he had some struggles throwing strikes himself. And here comes Josh Jorman back out there. You and I during the break were just talking. Jorman's had a long layoff over there on the bench. I'm sure he was bouncing around greeting teammates as they came back to the dugout after scoring runs. And Josh Jorman has a one-two count now on the leadoff hitter here in the top of the fourth. It's Justin Bowers. Well, it didn't take much to keep the energy levels up as well and I would argue too we've mentioned that it wasn't really flashy hitting it was just being able to work around the bases get a few walks and I think that the dugouts get more excited about that an extra base hit a double off the wall a homer they do provide a certain spark but when you string all of those singles and walks and those things like you're talking about together the hit batters I think you're right I think I think dugouts can maybe even get more excited about that just, you just kind of nitpick somebody to death. It's just like a steady jab in boxing over and over. You're not going for the knockout punch, but that jab very effective in the bottom of the third for Lynchburg. That next man up mentality too. You see your buddy do it, you got to go out and keep it going. Alec Riley will bloop one to second. Casual grab there by Ben Jones for out number two and Jake Benedict is up now for Christopher Newport. He flew out to center in his first at bat. 
Dorman does the love this inning so far, just being able to get through the ter first two batters relatively quickly. Justin Likas is up. So it's like my eighth mistake of the game, Evan, but Likas will swing through that one and miss. He's playing second base for Christopher Newport. He flew out to right in his first at bat, so I had part of it correct there. It's two away here in the top of the fourth. Christopher Newport trailing by eight. O2 oh, now, Jorman getting set to deal to Lycus with two outs. Lycus able to get that one off the end of the bat and foul it away. If you're seeing you early in this game, you really just have to look at it inning by inning. Because seeing a nine up on the scoreboard, that's a little difficult to overcome, but just start slicing into the lead. It won't happen here. Quick inning for Josh Jorman. Jorman with another strikeout, his fourth of the ball game. Lynchburg will try to add even more runs here in the bottom of the fourth inning. They lead 9-1 at Fox Field in Lynchburg. My name is Davion Washington, Jr. I have the honor of serving as the student body president. I have five little siblings. I'm the oldest of you know six siblings, and they look up to me. I'm setting the tone. I get to develop myself, make myself a better individual, but also I'm helping future generations, not even my family, but just future generations in general. You know, I found my passion here. I found, you know, the love uh, for what I want to do. You know, I've just really um, had an amazing time here. It's changed, like, my outlook on life. You don't have to be famous to change lives. You don't have to be on the big screen or whatever. I change lives now, and I hope to continue to do that. But just the same way that the University of Lynchburg has changed my life for the better. Gavin Collins back up for Lynchburg. It'll be six, seven, eight due up for the Hornets in the home half of the fourth inning. They are undefeated at home, 9-0 coming into this ball game. And there's still a lot of baseball left. Don't start counting the chickens just yet. And if you're Lynchburg, you'd love to get that, that run rule in effect here. Put a few across. And then you start thinking about even more as this ball from Collins will eat up the third baseman. Sam Benedict, Collins is on. We'll wait for the official ruling, but the leadoff man is aboard again for Lynchburg. They've done that the last two innings, Evan, so could be a good sign for the Hornets offense. Riley O'Donovan steps in, he is one for two. That one being a two RBI single in the last inning. Wasting no time to get back to it. Looks like that was ruled a hit. O'Donovan. Puts a charge into this, opposite field power, but the right fielder is under it. Aiden Stufel has it. Collins will retreat back to first, and there's one gone in the bottom of the fifth. You mentioned that run rule. You just think about Lynchburg's schedule, how busy they've been. You'd have to think it would be an awesome opportunity to get that and go to the weekend happy. Webster will swing at the first one under it. Benedict is there at third on the line. Now he drifts back in fair territory, makes the grab for the second out of the inning. Lynchburg, to your point, has been really good at seizing the opportunities that have been presented, not just in this game, but all year. It hasn't been a perfect season for Lynchburg. They're 17 and three, but for the most part, they have maximized their chances and opportunities. So you're right, if you could run rule a ranked team like CNU and Save the pitching staff a little bit. You save the pitching staff, but you also get your offensive stats up as well. You, all the hitters love it, a game like this, a high-scoring environment. Build those numbers up. Swing and a miss there from Atkins. 0-2 the count now with two gone in the bottom of the fifth. As we talk about run rules and all that, the inning may be coming to an end. No shortage of reps either. This is the third time through the lineup as... Garcia, who's on deck, will be batting for his fourth time if he gets up in this inning. So, like you said, still being able to get those stats. Carson Atkins hit twice. 
in that big nine-run third. He'll take time here. There is an 0-2 count. There is some activity in the Lynchburg bullpen. Josh, is, Josh Jorman is just getting some reps over there. He's not getting enough work on the mound. He's trying to stay loose and maybe continuing to get the feel of some of those off-speed pitches that he's been so effective with. Jorman struck out three out of the last four for Lynchburg. But the Hornets hitting right now. Atkins trying to keep the offensive portion going. He'll bloop this one over the shortstop's head, and the inning will continue. How about the base running from Gavin Collins? Two out, so he's going hard on contact. He never missed a beat coming around second there. So he scampers into third, and now it's runners at the corners for Lynchburg. Leadoff man Brandon Garcia will step in for his fourth plate appearance. How about that hustle, as you mentioned? Sometimes going into third, if it's somewhat of a close play, you might try to bait a throw there. And you can see Atkins maybe sneak second. But for now, runners on the corners. 9-1, the Lynchburg lead, seventh hit of the ball game. They've gotten on in a variety of ways. This man, Brandon Garcia, has an RBI single. And he has a base on balls as well. Now we're going to get a conversation between the catcher, Jarnowski and the coach, he's fixing the earpiece that CNU uses to signal in the pitches there, Evan. And uh, I, I guess it was just, it fell out in a way that Jarnowski couldn't fix it himself. And so the coach came over and helped out with the technology. And now we're back to baseball. Talked about that technology earlier. So much new stuff with the game. Really, it just feels like in the last few years, just what we're seeing. And we know the rule changes at the MLB level. Atkins will run. Garcia fouls it away. Yeah, so much changing in our game. And it's interesting to see the teams that do use the earpiece, calling pitches that method. Lynchburg does that as well, fans, if you didn't know. But some teams are still going old school with a coach signaling to the catcher. Some teams using the wristband. Some teams have the pitcher with a wristband as well. So the catcher doesn't even need to signal. There's a variety of methods now, and that's part of the fun is watching how each ball club gets those pitches in there. And, and then offensively as well, you get the same options, although not everybody can wear an earpiece on offense, but you do have some different systems that are being used. Atkins will run again. Good pitch to throw on, fastball away. Atkins is safe. Collins is going to come in with no throw. Double steal executed by Lynchburg. Brings in the 10th run of the game. Collins reached with a hard single that went up the third baseman's leg and arm. And then he advances to third on Atkins' base hit and now comes in to score on the stolen base. Get in double digits now, and I mean, it's one of those plays, too. You're just, if you're Collins on third, you're thinking about it a little bit more than the other people in the field. Like you said, I think the Hornets ex executed that perfectly. No hesitation. 10 to one, and Brandon Garcia still hitting. Two, two, two. Two balls, two strikes, and two gone. Make it three balls now. Count is full on the leadoff man, Brandon Garcia. One for two with a single and a walk so far in his return to play. He did get an inning defensively yesterday in Lynchburg's win over Hampton Sydney. Before that, previous game was March 11th. Had kind of a pesky quad injury, I think it was, Evan, and it was one where he tried to come back and re-aggravated it. So it gave him more time off, and fortunately Lynchburg has plenty of guys they can go to. Brandon Garcia will pass the baton again. Another walk, he is on first for his second freebie of the game. And it's Eric Hyatt, three for three so far. Have a day, Eric Hyatt. Garcia and Hyatt going one, two. We see how many times that they've got on, on base. That's now six between the two of them. Starting off the lineup, and as we've said all game, with Avery Neves behind them, just setting up some really nice chances. Good breaking ball from Gingras there. Just missed, 1-0 the count. That one up and in on Eric Hyatt. And that's the other thing we didn't mention is he thought he got hit by a pitch in his previous at bat, and he ends up getting his third hit of the game. I guess that falls under the, the ball don't lie category, right? Oh, you know it. <laughs> Hyatt was looking for it, too. I have a feeling when he 
Rounded first after that hit. Just going through his mind, knowing what he was able to do. Three really? count for Hyatt. Go, I'm sorry. This entire Hornet squad, I think. Any baseball team, really, just being able to get out. Showcase your, showcase your skills, excuse me, as Neve steps in. Hey, we've had to talk a lot today. It's a, it's a easy to get tongue-tied with all that's gone on, and it's still going on as now the bases are loaded for Avery Neves. Hyatt took a walk. He's been on board all four times in this one. I said the door was already blown off the hinges, and if Neves could do something big here, that I guess would be equivalent to knocking the whole house down. It would be like a bulldozer for Neves if he could punch the clock right here. Tough to figure out what the next step would be. It's going to be a steal for home. Atkins with a great read on the ball in the dirt. It got away from the catcher, Jarnowski, and he is in. Atkins scores. Outstanding speed by Atkins, but also the read as well. He sees the ball is down and extends it a little bit. And then here we go. The feet first slide in there ahead of the throw. It's run number 11 for Lynchburg. They lead by 10. Discipline on that slide. I think that might be a window, something along those lines. The house might be coming if yeah. Neves can get something. If Neves could, could launch one here. Fouls one off, and now it's a 2-1 count with two gone for Avery Neves. He does get under this, didn't get enough of it, though. Center fielder broke in initially and then back, now camped, and the inning is over, but Lynchburg does some more damage. They score two and now lead by 10 as we head to the top of the fifth at Fox Field, Lynchburg leading Christopher Newport. I wanted to be a physical therapist probably starting about halfway through college. I love the concept that exercise is medicine. You know, we're starting to discover that exercise really can remedy many of the things that we thought that only surgery or only drugs could remedy in the past. When the student comes here, it's because we believe in them, it's because we want them here, um, it's because we believe they'll be successful. The faculty here are, are devoted to their development, not only academically but also professionally. We're not so inundated with things that we don't have time to make students one of our highest priorities. We have your back. We're going we're gonna to help you through that. If you're willing to work, then we're willing to put the work into it and the effort to, to help you succeed. Oh, we've got them tuned in from all over on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network, Evan. And one of the all-time Lynchburg greats, Grayson Thurman, checking in, says he's loving the broadcast. We may have some big news to share about Mr. Thurman soon, but we, we can't. The ink is not dry yet. The lawyers and all those people are involved. They won't let us share anything yet. But stay tuned we'll to all the, uh, the social media channels. And I, I've talked about if you're, if you're not plugged in to Lynchburg sports on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, you got to get on there. And, of course, the website, Lynchburg Sports. Dot com. I just spend all my time on there. And Josh Jorman is spending some great time on the mound here for Lynchburg. He struck out three out of the last four captains he's faced. And we even saw him tweaking some things in the bullpen when, when Lynchburg was that? hitting. Yeah. After hours, maybe, but <laughs> he's, he came back out. Right. Well, Josh Jorman has given up three hits. You mentioned a little rocky in the first. There was a hit and a walk in there. But Lynchburg got the 4-6 three tic-tac-toe double play to end the threat and Jorman did give up one run in the third but for the most part he has been in control in command just doing outstanding stuff has walked two but really putting together exactly what the doctor ordered for Lynchburg and hey if you're Lucas Jones do you want to keep him out there as long as you can just not trying to have to use the bullpen too much but Still very capable. Almost Yanked there. Down the line by Stufel, yeah. Those plays from our angle, sometimes it's going to be 50 50. And just, just going back to Grayson Thurman a little bit, he gave me the scouting report early in the year on Josh Jorman. Said, 
you know, he's got some of the nastiest stuff on the staff. He doesn't have a, a big resume or body of work, but he's always been really crafty and really good as a pitcher. And he said that he thought we would see Josh Dorman some this year. How about a double in the right center gap for Stufel? No, rip and run around second base. He wants more than two. He'll take three, slides in head first, and it's a leadoff triple for Aiden Stufel. Two for two day. He clearly has not lost the fight. He's still engaged and in this one, despite CNU being down 11-1. Nice work there. We've seen it from Collins as well, just not slowing down at second. You have to keep running. Nice slide into third and no outs here for the captains. It's Sam Benedict, another left-handed hitter, one of four lefties in the lineup. No changes just yet for either ball club. Wonder if we'll see some new faces at some point. It's a 10-run game. As Benedict will knife one to left. Neves coming on, sliding grab, missed it. Ball popped out. Probably goes down as a hit. It will, regardless of scoring, be a run as Aiden Stufel comes across for the second run of the game for Christopher Newport. 11-2, Lynchburg's lead trimmed slightly. Good effort from Neves there. You know, it's so difficult being in the outfield because you want to be able to get a throw in as well, but first you got to make that catch. But still, not an easy angle on it. And Neves gets so much credit for the offense with good reason. He deserves even more credit probably. But he's a good defender too, Evan. He really plays a good left field speed, throws well. Bunt here, Jormand is off, throws to first, out recorded there. And that is the first one gone in the top of the fifth inning. We talk about an All-American too. You have to do it on all sides of the game. And I think what Avery Neves really does well, because not only is it on the stat sheet, offensively and defensively, but you just see guys that are able to rally behind him. And with his spot in the lineup or his spot in left field, he can really just bring everyone in and get them involved, which is not an easy thing to do in baseball. Yet to make an impact as an outfielder. This one kicks away and almost got in the dugout. Would have been a dead ball if it did go in the dugout over there on the visitor's side. But Pokorak scrambling to it. And it is still a wild pitch. Will advance the runner to third. So Josh Reinhold is at the plate. He's got a two for two day working. He doesn't want to slow down his offensive production. Score won't matter to Reinhold here as he'll try to continue his perfect day. 11-2, the Lynchburg lead. One run has come across here for the captains in the top of the fifth. See Garcia, Garcia shaded over a little bit to the left. Thinking that Reinhold's going to pull, as we said, two hits on the day so far. Strike there, second one of the at bat. It is a one two count now with one gone. Garcia really good going to the backhand. I, I think you would prefer to be in a little bit more in the hole as a shortstop to have more plays to the forehand side, the glove hand side. That should be easier. I think, in general, all infielders should probably actually play a little bit more to their left than they do because, you know, if you're third baseman, that way, nothing gets between you and the line, and then everything, again, would be a forehand play. You could come across to your glove side to cut it off. But just my personal take there. Seems to open up the field a little bit, too. Right. Some guys are good going to the backhand. Brandon Garcia, we've seen him make some fabulous backhand plays already this season. Full count now as we discuss infield positioning and so much more here on a Wednesday afternoon. Jorman deals. This one just misses. And it will be a walk. So now Jorman has walked three. And he's given up five base hits. Here comes a chat from Pokerak. He'll go chat with Josh Jorman. And we know Jarnowski's been walked twice today, so maybe a little bit of strategy here. Runners on the corners. Yeah, I think that's part of the conversation piece here. You give Jorman a chance to Catch his breath here, keep the heart rate down, and then go over the game plan against the three-hole hitter, Zach Jarnowski. So really a great a great timeout, a great way to refresh your pitcher and remind him of 
what you're trying to attack Jarnowski with, or perhaps maybe not attack him. He's taken two walks already. And with a nine-run lead, you can be a little bit choosy about pitching to a guy. I think you phrased it perfectly. Sometimes with these big boppers, you'd rather give up one base on the walk than extra bases and runs scored. So we'll see how Jorman chooses to attack a very good three-hole hitter. Well, when he's batting 373 too, sometimes you're going to issue that free pass. But even then, he's his on-base percentage is 541. Yeah. So I think a lot of pitchers have that in mind. Exactly. Jorman across for a strike with a breaking ball there, though. Wasn't shy. This pitch just nibbles. Good hard fastball there. Just missed. 1-1 one, one the count. One gone. There is activity in the Lynchburg bullpen. And it's not Josh Jorman getting extra reps this time. It would, it would be a new pitcher that we might see. Breaking ball in the dirt. Runner from first will advance to second. Maybe a smart decision not to throw there because that's almost – Exact same play that we saw on the other side of the inning with Lynchburg back in that fourth, being able to steal home. Good slide there by Pokorak and kept it in front. It, it did kick off to the side, but it didn't get behind. That's when that runner from third would have a, a good chance to advance. So nice work defensively. Those catchers are so underappreciated, I think. Putting the gear on there and doing a thing that, that – your natural instinct is, is to get out of the way of the ball or turn your head and try to pick it. Your natural instinct is not to try to put your belly button on it and knock it down, but that's what those great catchers do. And that time, Pokorak had to jump out in the other batter's box and snare that one. It's a full count with one out. Such a big task behind the plate, but then you even consider runners who are stealing. Lots of things to keep your head around. Jorman to Jarnowski. Swing it, tipped it back in the glove. That's a strikeout. Two gone. And a big K there from Jorman to get the danger man, Zach Jarnowski. Now two outs with runners on the corners. You got the force at first or second. Nice work from Jorman there. Fifth strikeout of the game for Josh Jorman. Uh, in his other appearance this season against Greensboro, he struck out two in four innings of work. So you get what, on paper, again, baseball is so weird, but on paper you get a great offensive team like Christopher Newport, and Jorman has struck out more than he did against a team with a losing record, Greensboro. But that's baseball right there in a nutshell. You can't explain this stuff sometimes. You, no want, it, you want it to make sense, but it never does. Ball two is low, 2-0 -oh count now for Justin Bowers who has struck out once himself. He hits with two in scoring position. Christopher Newport trying to fight their way back in this game, down 11 to two. Swung on and belted. At Atkins will give chase. He's got room, catches just in front of the track, and the inning is over. One run does come across on two CNU hits. They strand two, and we'll head to the bottom of the fifth inning on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. Tim Slusser from the Outdoor Leadership Program gave a presentation at a teaching and learning resources conference here about getting his program more involved on the academic side of campus. I mentioned uh, computers and mapping and he mentioned caving and eventually we came up with the idea of mapping caves. So the week before we were able to learn how to use the instruments kind of like on a flat surface and just kind of get a hang of how they work. But it was really amazing how once we got in the cave, it was a completely different experience using them. It was unique. It got most of us out of our comfort zone, kind of gave us a new experience, a new taste of something new. But I think the most difficult parts were getting the lighting right. Um, you had to read the instruments with the headlamps while keeping your eye pointed on the plot point this allowed them to actually literally get their hands dirty, uh, collecting data, conducting measurements, and putting all that together in the form of a Gift Day 2022 is just around the corner. And today I'm inviting you to make history with me on Thursday, April 7th. 
During those 24 hours, we'll look back on 119 years and reimagine our future together. Did you know that our entire history is grounded in giving? The university we are today began in April 1903 with a gift of $100 from Dr. Josephus and Sarah Hopwood. On April 7th, we will continue that tradition of giving. So join me in supporting everything that makes this such an extraordinary place to live, learn and grow. Gifts to the Lynchburg Fund support all aspects of your Lynchburg experience. They spark innovation and seek collaboration across campus and in our community. Welcome back here in the bottom of the fifth. Pleased to be joined by our Director of Digital Media, Tim Laduca, as Lynchburg, an 11-2 lead, and they're back up at the plate. Yeah, so Ivan... Oh, this one swung on and belted. Off the at the, base wall. Of the wall. How about this Benton Jones kid, huh? He has been impressive all season long. It just seems like Lucas Jones and company, they just really are able to get, you know, the most out of this recruiting area, always bringing in guys who are ready to compete right away. But you, you go past, you go through the list of rookies of the year. Uh, last year you have Nick Matfield won the Rookie of the Year. It was his second season, but it was his first year playing uh, Battle of Injury his freshman season. Then you got Gavin Collins. Take a quick, uh, uh, you can take a quick respite from giving a Lynchburg player the Rookie of the Year award, but then you got Garrett Jackson the year before that. So it just you're going to have to rename the Rookie of the Year award the Lynchburg Rookie of the Year award and then start oh, giving it to somebody it. else as well because the Lynchburg Hornets are really just able to Find first-year players that are ready to produce at a very high level right off the bat. And having competition in high school is always a plus, too. Here's Pokerak. It's going to be popped up foul, and that's going to be recorded for out number one. Yeah, and well, I'd have to imagine that other players, when deciding where to go to school, it's a good mix here with Lynchburg. Yeah, you can come to a good team, but usually that means there's people in front of you that you have to wait for. But you look around at some of the young players around the field, and the, the, the young players know, hey, I, if I prove myself, I'm gonna, I can prove myself worthy to be in the lineup no matter how young I am. Because, you know, some coaches are going to make a, a, a first-year player wait, wait their turn. But if you're, you're crushing it in batting practice and you're, you're opening the eyes of the coaches, the staff is going to give you your opportunity, and that shines with, you know, Brandon Garcia, Ben Jones, you know, Logan Tatman on the bump lately. So... It's really good for, for Lynchburg to be showcasing their young talent, and unapologetically so. Well, you hit the nail on the head, and I think really with all athletic programs at Lynchburg, we've seen freshmen who have had a dominant presence, but particularly for Lucas, Lucas Jones' squad. And I think you said it too, just the competition aspect, being able to get out. We see the performances they've been stringing together and just building confidence because we know that the experience is there from guys like Neves in the lineup mm -hmm. who – have been around success and then freshmen able to come in. And that's kind of the beauty of the midweek game, you know, especially out of conference. On Saturday and Sunday, you're rolling out your A, your, your a squad. Then you go out and you play Greensboro in a midweek and you let Benton Jones take some A-Bs and, uh-oh, he goes Yabo twice. And you're like, okay, you know well, what? maybe we gotta, we got to let him play on a Saturday too. And he's been able to perform when it matters, you know, even a little bit more. Every game matters, but... You know, playing on Saturday, Sunday is what you is what you 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 dream about getting getting into college. So, one of those unique quirks too about college baseball, obviously a big difference between midweek games and weekend series. But I think just being able to have some consistency across both, we know that there are so many players in this lineup that will go play on weekends as well. And just what that does going into conference tournaments, always going to be impressive. Here's Gavin Collins. He's batting 272 on the season out of Centerville High School. Runner on second for the Hornets. Full count and one out. He's going to have some contact. It's going to go right above there. And the out from Benedict. Excuse me, that was recorded an out from Lycus. So two outs here in the bottom of the fifth. So I said, Tim Laduca joining us here on LHSN. Yeah, and Evan Gates, you're a freshman sensation, aren't you? Uh, well, I think the people that I work with make my job a lot, very <laughs> easy. So this, uh, this LHSN crew just 
outstanding at what they do. We know if you haven't been paying attention to LHSN, just a lots of behind the scenes work from Tim LaDuca all around the staff. We are very blessed here bringing you ODAC baseball. Man, how about Riley O'Donovan getting knocked down to the six seven hole and then you know in a lineup like Lynchburg there is there's got it can't be any egos, but you know, plug in a, a heavy hitter like Riley O'Donovan into the seven hole really gives no rest for an opposing pitcher. You know, you, you work through your knees, you get through your Benton Jones, you get past Brennan Garcia who seems to get on base every single time at the top of the lineup. You're like, okay, here we go. Seven here's here's the here's the seven hole hitter. Oh, this guy second on the team in home runs last year. <laughs> so good luck trying to work your way through this Lynchburg lineup without uh, turning black and blue a little bit. And then you think about it, Webster is batting eighth as well, mm -hmm. and he's been near the top of the lineup. And batting ninth is Carson Atkins, who's above 300 in batting average. So you just – there are no breaks in this lineup, something that is characteristic of successful squads. It's going to be a pop-up to left field. And that's out number three here in the bottom of the fifth. But the Hornets still up nine as we're about over halfway through this ball game on LHSN. It's almost April, and you guessed it, Give Day is coming. It's been 119 years since the university was founded by Josephus Hopwood in April of 1903 with a gift of $100. We're not asking that everyone give $3,000, though we won't turn you down if you do. How much you give isn't the point. It's that you join in on Give Day to give what you can. A dollar can buy a cup of coffee, but if we all pitch in, those dollars can help fund some really impressive stuff. Your help is improving our athletic facilities. I mean, have you seen the scoreboard? It's perfect for games and movie nights. It may not be flashy, You've helped update the AC in Hop Sigler, and that's huge. Think about it. We've got a cadaver lab in here. And if that isn't your thing, this digital anatomy table was also funded with help of people just like you. Remember when we had problems with the dam? Well, we've been working with the city to replace the old bridge, add the new traffic circle. And with your support, College Lake is turning into a new urban wetland that students can learn in for years to come. I mean, the Lynchburg Fund helps everywhere. Lynchburg started with a $100 gift. That gift, combined with 119 years of hard work, dedication, and love, turned into all of this. Imagine what your gift can do. It's a sunny Wednesday afternoon back here on LHSN. The Hornets are up nine on the captains. And a ranked matchup. Pleased to have you joining us here. It's going to be Riley up to bat for the captains. And, and he's facing Jarmond here, the lefty on the mound. He's in the sixth inning with only 53 pitches. Really efficient on the bump so far for Jarmond. He's going to get a quick out here to Avery Neves. Collects that one and left. But I was kind of surprised. I was going through stats last year, just making, just doing some housekeeping, and I realized German had recorded one out on the mound. I only had ever seen him hit. He recorded one out against uh, Greensboro in a, in a blowout win last year. I thought it was a mistake. I'm like, uh-oh, we accidentally put German into pitch. Went to watch the game film, and I saw German on the, on the mound. I'm like, okay, he's a little two-way player. Didn't think too much of it. But would you believe me if I told you this? He spent all summer, Jorman did, played for three teams during the summer. Uh, he played for the Chili Dogs in the Northern Virginia College Baseball League, went overseas with the MVP international team playing in Central Europe, and he also pitched for the Burlington Sock Puppets in the Appalachian League. Didn't take any at-bats. Only pitched all summer, was working on his mechanics, you know, working on, you know, you know, going long innings and get, getting the outings, being comfortable out on the mound. And I think that Jormand being able to produce, especially in these midweeks, keep some of the other arms fresh the rest of the week, it's going to be really important. And you can't also forget about his prowess at the plate. When he's not on the bump, he's going to be hitting 300 for you. That is a complete player for sure, as we see Benedict get on first. You mentioned it too, just no at-bats in the summer because a lot of these guys, at least if they're doing both, you'll see that go into the summer where they'll still be swinging the bat. But you have to think Jorman's confident in his pitching, and while it doesn't show up on the stat sheet, he's going to be a big presence here. 
for the Hornets. And I guess I should kind of correct myself. No, no uh, at bats and while playing for the Burlington Sock Puppets, he only focused on pitching there. That was his longest stint. He got some hits when he was out in Central Europe doing a little, you know, mini barnstorming tour, as you might be able to call <laughs> it, for uh, for uh, the MVP international team, coached by uh, German's father, Pudge German. How about that? Not yeah. a lot of college kids get that opportunity too to go overseas for the summer. As Lycus steps in here for the captains. German, I thought when I was talking to him, this is punch popped up. Oh, Pokerak making like a little play. How about that? Takes a little bit of movement behind the plate. He made that one look easy. So here's something I want to talk to you about, Evan. Pokerak there kept his helmet in his hand. Maybe that's because it was so quick, but they teach the catchers, take that mask off and throw it as far as you can. Get it out. I've started to see catchers hold on to it. And I think what, they, I, what I heard is that the catcher wants to hold on to it because the split second that it takes to change – you know, you're looking for the ball up in the air, you're getting underneath it, and you're going to shed it too. Just getting rid of your attention for that split second throwing the mask away can mess everything up as you're trying to catch a pop-up, which is hard to do for a catcher. So I've started to see uh, catchers hold on to that thing. What do you think about that? Would you hold on to the mask or get rid of it? I think I would hold on. And as you mentioned too, you know, with a sunny sky right now, just having that split second, uh -huh. there's so many things happening on the baseball field. And we know there's a runner on first as well. So you're thinking, what if it stays fair if you dropped it? So uh -huh. many different situations. That one's going to go foul. So here's another quiz for you. Maybe you got to be careful when you throw that helmet, when you hold on to that helmet, because if you got to be careful not to use the helmet to aid yourself catching. If you use the catcher's mask, any way to aid yourself getting the ball, whether you're picking it up off the ground, you catch it in the helmet, it's actually a balk. How about that? Yeah. Catcher's balk. You have to think the baseball rule book is pretty big. We've yeah. talked about so many of those little quirks throughout this season. Yeah. So you got to be careful. If you're going to hold on to your helmet, just don't use it to your advantage. You have to use it for the right reasons. So that one's going to be pulled down the line. Was it fair? It's going to be foul. Kyle Haney mentioned earlier in the season how – Runners will also earn bases if you go out there with a mitt instead of a glove. Uh-huh. Well, I remember hearing about that one. So many different little rules that <laughs> maybe you get out on the field you're not thinking about. Yeah. But it had to happen for someone to issue the rule, too. Yeah. So you wonder who the first catcher was to use that helmet. It's going to be the pitch down, and it's going to be taken care of at first. So solid half of the inning again for Jorman. The score remains 11-2 here on LHSN at James C. Fox Field. Get your career in the game by enrolling in the University of Lynchburg MBA program with an emphasis in sport management. This program opens the doors to new possibilities for a variety of careers. From being an athletic director or working in athletic administration to working for professional organizations, your favorite team to running a local parks and rec department. And employers are increasingly requesting and preferring individuals who have postgraduate education specifically looking for an MBA. And so the University of Lynchburg Sport Management concentration in the MBA program sets you up for success and it sets you apart from the many other people looking for jobs in the industry. Learn from winners. Here you will learn from professors and mentors who have spent their careers doing exactly what you want to do. Increase your marketability in an $83 billion industry. If you have a 3.0 GPA, the GMAT is waived. There's no application fee, admissions occurs on a rolling basis, and our online program is ideal for working adults. When you enroll in this program, you enroll in the opportunity to learn from the best of the best. Your professors have a wealth of experience working in the sport industry that they share with you in the classroom setting. Get in the game by getting your MBA with a sport management concentration at the University of Lynchburg. Let's see now, Hollywood, here I come. <laughs> Hey, I meant yeah. either. The real Lindsay Piper is here. <laughs> Autographs that later. Let's Bottom of the sixth here on LHSN. Jack Anderson is on the mound for CNU. 
And it looks like we will have a pinch hitter in Harding stepping up to the plate. Jackson Harding batting 300 on the season. And the Hornets still up nine. You have to wonder if that rule will come into effect regarding a 10 run lead. The opposing team has to bat in seven innings for that to happen. So if Lunchburg puts something on the scoreboard in this inning, we will keep you updated. It's been a solid effort so far. Josh Jorman has been on the mound throughout the first six innings for the Hornets as Anderson will throw a strike. This is unofficially CNU week for Lynchburg Sports. Women's lacrosse is up in Newport News taking on the captains. Uh, men's, men's tennis will take on the captains on Sunday. Men's lacrosse has a huge matchup as there's a error there by, by the first baseman as Harding reaches. Uh, men's lacrosse, huge matchup. Number one team in the country, captains coming to town. Playing number 11, Lynchburg. Am I missing any? We playing I don't believe else? so. It's a lot like high school, too. You see sometimes athletic departments will schedule games with one team. We've talked about it all season, really. Tons of <laughs> sports teams on the spring side that have found success for Lynchburg as Carson Atkins steps into the box. Such a great time of year for sports, not only in college, but just in general. We know the Final Four coming up this weekend. And as you mentioned, the final four for the, for the men's coming up, also coming up for the women's out in Seattle, they're actually sending the Division Two and Division Three women's basketball final four to that site as well, where you're going to see the captains uh, in competition there. Uh-oh, this one's schmacked. Atkins might have one out. It's going to be at the warning track. See ya. It's a two-run shot for Carson Atkins. He made that one look easy. And as we said, the Hornets now a double-digit lead. It's going to be 13 to 2 in the bottom of the sixth. Yeah, and that's his fourth in the last two weeks. You mentioned Carson Atkins hitting 300, you know, batting out of that nine hole. And really, Carson Atkins was more of, you know, he's a guy who's going to catch literally everything in center field. He's going to get walked a lot. He's also going to strike out a lot, not going to get on, get on base with his bat much. But this year, it has been so pivotal for Lynchburg to have a guy like Carson Atkins in the lineup doing that at the bottom of the line because now you turn it over and you got you got Brandon Garcia so having Carson Atkins with so much confidence at the dish here as the calendar turns to April is really going to make a world of difference for Lynchburg through the ODAC stretch you believe it as that's going to be out recorded at first Jarnowski picked it up bare hand so many hitters in this lineup for the Hornets that we've talked about everyone is capable but like you said, it's about timing as well. Just what time of the season are you going to have those hits? And Atkins has certainly started to wake up at the right time. But in center field, we've seen the plays that he is able to make. The Hornets pouring it on in this one. It's an 11-run lead. Yeah, and, and Atkins is a guy who you know, we, we've seen flashes of it throughout his career here. This is his fifth year in the Hill City. He's been a starter this entire time here almost all because of his defense at times. But we've seen him go yard. He was the player of the week early on in the season uh, in the ODAC last year. So he's got the stretches, and it was just a matter of time until Atkins was able to put it together. He had a grand slam against William Peace last year, you know, stealing bases. So it, that's another thing. If he gets on base a lot, the speed that he possesses to start stealing bases, it's man, a threat. It's fun. As Hyatt is three for three, he's in the batter's box. So many Hornets capable of getting bases as well. Talked about Neves earlier, who leads the team in stolen bases. <laughs> yeah. You just think he can do everything. And yeah. it's really the same can be said for a lot of these players, just not specializing in one category of the game, being able to really go do it all. Neves is his second all-time in the program record books for stolen bases. So he really is just a guy who's going to be able to do it all. Uh, and... I'm excited to see where his career takes him uh, after Lynchburg because he's another one of those players that could end up going places. We've seen quite a few, even on this roster, that are capable to keep playing after. Always interesting, too, because we know how difficult it can be to make it to the major leagues or even to be able to play professionally. That's and always the dream. 
It's really, you just think about it in any sport. Growing up as a little boy, you really, you want to be able to go out there and compete at the highest level. As we just mentioned, it's Neves in the batter's box, runner on first for the Hornets. So, Evan, I know I've been talking a lot. I've been telling a lot of stories, but how about this one? You're probably not going to believe this one. I was, okay. I was writing the team of the week release just now in the press box before I hopped on the air. Avery Neves has earned his third team of the week honor. Uh, the RBI record in the conference for a career is 200. If Neves keeps the pace he's on right now and plays all 50 or so games that's on the schedule, guess how many home uh, RBIs Neves is going to finish with if he stays on pace? Ooh. That's going to be a tough number. He's going to be on pace for 201, the math that I worked it out. He's wow. got 28 right now. He's on pace for 67 this year, came into the year with 132. So he is on how pace about that? to break the ODAC record by one RBI at this moment in time. And he already we broke know the, he can do it. Yeah, he already holds the single season record. He had 69 last uh, two years ago. He already, already broke the single season record. And also, keep in mind, this is only his – third season playing for Lynchburg. He played two full years the year before for Lynchburg. He's halfway through his third. So he's doing this in an un, you know, an unnatural amount of games. He doesn't have the full career that a lot of other players, you know, these see these conference records, these program records being broken because guys get extra years of eligibility because of COVID. This is only his third year, and he's already all over the record book in the conference and in the program. And you wouldn't think it just watching him too as well because we know – like you mentioned with COVID, there are some players that are coming back fifth, six years. Mm -hmm. We know that guys who are 24, 25 still <laughs> playing college yeah, ball. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Grayson Thurman last year, uh, he's older older than I am. Out wow. On the, he's out there. A couple of guys uh, and, and, and women on the teams across Lynchburg are about just a year older than me or around the same age as me. So it's funny at times to uh, to think about that because of COVID. I always think about that, too, just with college athletes because we see such a difference in age. As we mentioned with the Hornets, just experience levels. We have a lot of freshmen out there. But something in any sport that's always interesting to watch, especially if you watch MLB baseball, you see 40-year-old veterans playing alongside the 19, 20-year-old uh -huh. rookies. It's part of the beauty of the game. Mm -hmm. Ben Jones at the plate. So we said we've really liked what we've seen from the freshman this season. Went to the same high school as Brandon Garcia. And he's going to earn his free pass. So the Hornets will have runners on first and second with two down. If you could rename the walk, what would you rename it to? Because oh, wow. it really isn't a walk. No, Everyone it's not. Everyone jogs down to first. But a jog just sounds a little bit iffy. Yeah, but, I mean, so what is it? A free maybe, pass? Maybe it's a, a base stroll? On ball. Maybe that's a base on balls. That was the original name, and, it, and the nickname Walk has just taken over because the official shorthand for it is BB. So I guess Walk is the nickname. Well, anyone with a score sheet in their hands <laughs> is going to be writing down BB. BB yeah, but. yeah. So base on balls, nickname Walk. I am in favor of rename of renicknaming the base on balls, the jog. Tim LaDuca special. We're yeah. going to get into the scorebook today. Yeah. yeah. You think about it, too. So many different abbreviations and stuff to look at if you're looking at the scorecard. So it's one of those things. Baseball is known for its history and just having an official, formal approach if you're writing stuff down. Something that when you see changes in the game, it opens your eyes a little bit. As it's going to be Pokerack at the plate. He's catching today. Pokerak, he's got a, he's real mature looking behind the plate. You know, he's he's sturdy. He receives the ball well, uh, and I think that that goes a long way for the confidence of the pitcher on the mound. You know, you may be a little apprehensive as you're delivering to a freshman behind the plate, like, hey, if I if I put too much English on this curveball, I might be going to the backstop. But Pokerak, he's a, he's a brick wall there behind the plate, and I think that goes a long way for the pitchers uh, pitching on the mound even when you're throwing to a freshman. Like you said, he earns your trust. 3-1 yep. count. It's going to be full now, two outs, so the runners will be going on this pitch. 
here in the bottom of the sixth. That's a 13 to two lead for the Hornets in a ranked matchup. Josh Jormand, one of the key figures in this one for the Hornets. Not a typical starter, but he's gone six, just allowing two runs. Runners going, and it's in there for strike three. So caught looking as Pokerak. But the Hornets still have an 11 run lead here on LHSN. We'll be right back. Yeah, but before we do, I'm oh, going I'm I'm to check out here for a second. Uh, we're going to get Kyle Haney back on the call. Evan, it was a pleasure working with you As here. As always. Such a fun time being on the call with you. Keep up the good work. I'll be in the background listening. Tim LaDuca, Director of Digital Media. Thank you for hopping on here today on LHSN. As we head into the top of the seventh, Hornets trying to get things done. We're stranded. I hope Tim is safe. She's fine. <laughs> Where are we going today, Tim? Monument Creek. How far? Debatable. <laughs> How do you think it's going to go? I think it's going to go well. I think we're going to have one big climb that's going to kind of suck. But then after that, we're going to have some incredible views. And it's happening. It's very mental. The worst part is when you first start, but you got to keep going and you take your breaks and you look up and you enjoy the view and it's all worth it. Hey mom, it's just Kate and I here. Hey Jean, eating some jerky? It's extra good at this spot. How's it going? Great. <laughs> That's what you ask every, what do you think? How's it going? What else am I going to ask? What do you think about the river, Megan? Pretty cool. Well, great answer. <laughs> Well done, done. Megan, how was the open air toilet? How would you rate it on a scale of one to ten? Based on I don't know. Ninety-seven pitches, and yes, Josh Dormand is back out here for the seventh. As we said, Kyle Haney back with us. My name is Evan Gates on LHSN. It has been a nice performance for the Hornets. Up 11 and a chance to end things early. I'm not sure how you could script it much better if you're Coach Lucas Jones. You know, going in, obviously, we said they have confidence. They, they expect to win ball games. They expect to win at home, undefeated at home this season as this ball will get sent into center field and Carson Atkins makes a grab. How about another dinger from Atkins? Wow. It was... It's almost like he gets in the box. He's just so comfortable with driving it. And with that one, it's almost anticlimactic at this point with the score line. But you have to pay attention to those performances. Atkins is just so impressive. And he's been locked into that nine-hole spot in the order, but not an afterthought, Evan. And that's, that's one that I think the new school, the metrics and the, and the analytics have shown a lot of baseball coaches that that nine spot matters quite a bit because – Again, we're assuming you got your best hitters hitting one, two, three, like typical. Well, in every inning but the first inning, that nine-hole guy becomes a table setter and can get on. Then you have the added bonus that Carson Atkins can go yard. Uh, it's, it's a great setup that Lynchburg has, and there is, again, a reason why he's been locked into that nine spot all season long. And I think it's interesting, too, because a lot of times people will look at the lineup is just up and down, but as you said, you're circling through it. As mm. nice play in right field to record the out. That's the new man Jackson Harding coming on from Keysville to make a key play for Lynchburg. Uh, props to Harding too. He's, he, he's a guy that can play second base and play in the outfield. So there's a nice weapon at your disposal, a utility guy who can get it done all around the diamond. And we'll get a mountain visit from Associate Head Coach Travis Beasley, and that may be the day for Josh Jorman. But, boy, tip your cap, stand up, and give him a round of applause. Maybe we can get a shot of the dugout coming out to greet him here. What a fantastic performance by Josh Jorman against the 12th-ranked team in the country, by the way. Not just mop-up duty against any old ball club. Josh Jorman pitched into the seventh against Christopher Newport, Gave up six hits, threw a few walks in there, 
But, man, just, I think, a performance we're going to remember for a long time for Josh Jorman. Well, obviously, allowed two runs, but six hits, too. He just, it, all the contact was minimal. I mean, really settling in early, and we talked about maybe keeping that heart rate down, but he really didn't have to. He's just came out consistently, and he really had his stuff today. Hopefully, we'll get to chat with Josh Jorman once the game is over. That's another great thing about LHSN and everything that's going on, some of those post-game interviews, post-match interviews with the other sports. So great to hear from our student athletes. And you get a little slice of the personality in those interviews as well. Some of those behind the scenes, did you watch the, the mic'd up stuff with the golf team? I mean, I love I that did. kind of stuff. It was awesome. We remember women's basketball had one back in the winter. It's one of those things we can stand here and describe the action all day for you, but really you don't get to see that other layer until you get to see the players and athletes from their perspective. As the Hornets up 11 here in the bottom, excuse me, the top of the seventh. Looking to close things down early via the 10 run rule. Alex Gianna Scoli is on for Lynchburg. He's got great numbers coming in, Evan. 1.93 earned run average in five appearances. Four and two-thirds innings. He's only given up one earned run on the season, and he has become a real threat out of the bullpen for Lynchburg, a bullpen that has been tested a bit lately, but has so many options, youth and experience in that bullpen. And you get guys that can come at you from the right and left side as well. So that's great for a coach to be able to play some of those matchup games as well. And you already see Gianna Scoli come set right around the belt, kind of hides the ball from you. He's a tall guy, can use that height and that leverage, get downhill and come at you. 1-1 one, one count here for Gianna Scoli. He hit the nail on the head. Hopefully a quick appearance for him. Chance to end it here for the Hornets. And out recorded at first. We will go to the bottom of the seventh, it would appear. Evan, you just always get tested and kept on your toes in these games. Uh, sometimes with the non-conference games, when you go with the ground rules at the beginning, you'll, you'll say, hey, are we doing the 10-run rule or not? So we're going to see more baseball. How about I don't that? Know, maybe it looks us, makes us look bad, but how about more baseball? That's the positive That's here. Always a treat. We'll get to hit again in the bottom of the seventh. Uh, and each conference will have different rules as well, which we actually briefly touched on off the air. Sometimes you'll have the 10 run rule in the regular season, but not in the tournament, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll continue to roll here. It's a 13-2. Uh, do we need to take any more breaks? We'll check with our wonderful production staff here with the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. And I think we'll just roll right through this and continue to enjoy the sunshine here on this Wednesday. It's gonna be a busy weekend uh, you and Tim were discussing all the athletics going on. Lynchburg set to host Eastern Mennonite in a doubleheader here at Fox Field on Saturday. There is some rain in the forecast. Schedule has not been changed yet, but that's another reason why you got to stay plugged in with the social media so you can get those uh, schedule changes. Um, and I think if it does look like Sunday ends up being the better day to play, maybe the Hornets will do that. We saw that against Washington Lee this previous weekend. As you said, on the baseball diamond, seen that quite a few times, trying to keep the field in the best shape possible. You Got said it, beautiful Wednesday afternoon for baseball. And if we can get a few more innings, we'll take it. And, and my, my great friend, Brian Goddard, listening and watching, thinking that we should mention this is a battle between two ranked teams here. But there are also two other ranked teams in the state of Virginia, two ODAC teams as well, Randolph-Macon and Shenandoah. So baseball in the Commonwealth right now, very, very good, very strong. And we're going to get to see matchups against Randolph-Macon and Shenandoah later on in the year. It's going to be a great season. We're, we're basically midway through. Lynchburg 17-3, and three, so this is game 21 of 40 in the regular season for Lynchburg. And there is a lot of baseball left. We've seen some great things already. Talk about how solid the performance has been from Lynchburg thus far. As long as the numbers stick, 
They will continue to be undefeated at home. It seems like they just are so comfortable when they come back. They haven't really had too many extended trips. We know they opened up the season on the road for a tournament, but the Hornets have really stayed composed the rest of the way. You have three losses, one to CNU on the road in Newport News, one in that opening weekend trip to Georgia against Piedmont, and then a split in a doubleheader with Roanoke. That was on the road in Salem a couple weekends ago. Every game in the ODAC seems to be a dogfight, and, and you assume even your midweek games are going to be a dogfight. You assume it's going to come down to the wire. So it's nice when you get a blowout game like this and you can you can breathe and relax just a little bit. Helps out everyone, not just the pitching staff, but just getting up to the plate, not having as much pressure as Collins is going to ground out. Yeah, and I think at this point in the season as well, we've mentioned confidence a lot, and I know it can sound over-mentioned, but just how in the game of baseball, how much it means to go out to be consistent. It's something that's never taken for granted. It's such a weird thing, baseball, because it, it is a game of failure. You hear people talk about that, and it kind of sounds like a cliche, but it's true because, again, if you haven't heard this, fans, a good hitter is going to hit 300, but that means they're getting out seven out of ten times. Maybe 400 is the better mark in, in college baseball. But either way, you're failing more times than you're successful. So the key is to stay confident through all those failures, and that is not an easy thing to do. It's the same way with pitching. Uh, everybody that's ever pitched has had a rough outing where they can't get out of the inning, they give up a bomb, etc. and you can just throw that, that um, thought process all around the diamond. I mean, everybody that's picked up a baseball has made a bad throw at one point. Even, even the best defenders of all time have made errors. So everybody's going to fail. It's how you respond to that and hopefully you can not keep making the same mistakes over and over. That's a big key from it as well. Try to learn from those failures. And I think the failure can motivate you as well. I certainly think we've seen Lynchburg play better after those three losses. Um, now they're, they're in, such a, in such a point now <laughs> that, that when you have so many victories to not many losses, you don't get to have that bounce back and revenge factor that we've talked about as much. But it's fascinating and it's fun to talk about. And that's the great thing about baseball with the pace as we get a pitching change here. You have some time to discuss these things and go on these uh, long-winded tangents. We got a peek there at Ron Frazier, the pitching coach for CNU. He's been around for a while. This is actually a CNU coaching staff that has been together off and on for about 20-plus seasons. Uh, coach Frazier, he took a few years off. But for the most part, this CNU coaching staff, continuity, they know each other, they know – what they're going to get. How about Lynchburg's coaching staff? I mean, that's a group that's been together through this run of success. We always talk about Coach Lucas Jones, but the associate head coach, Travis Beasley, handling the pitching numbers. Uh, pitching members is just one of the all-time great coaches in baseball, I think. You get the Garcia brothers, Gabe and Oscar, who I got to hang out with. And, um, man, Jack, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just great, this coaching staff. Michael Solbach, too is a guy who a lot of the pitchers love, working with the pitching staff. And then Brady Moore, the director of baseball analytics, very important to the program as well. Two coaching staffs that have been around success and knows really what it takes to get to that next level. That's something that's always important. As the pitching change will be from Brandon Cassidy of CNU. 4-3-4 ERA. This is going to be his seventh appearance on the season. He started five, so this will be a relief outing as he retires O'Donovan. Yeah, Brandon Cassidy. It's a different spelling from Jay Cassidy, who was basically the ace for CNU. Jay Cassidy pitched in the game against Lynchburg earlier in the season, but he's only thrown once since then. He's on the shelf right now. I think once Christopher Newport gets Jay Cassidy back, they're going to feel really good about their postseason chances. But Brandon Cassidy, different spelling, uh, also some really good numbers and some strong work this year for Christopher Newport. 
We know depending on the matchup, too, you're not sure which pitcher will throw. There was conversations about whether Cassidy would start this one, and obviously Weber came in for CNU, but two pitching staffs that certainly have the arms to get it done come tournament time. It's so interesting with different coaches. Some guys have the plan really scripted out, and they're not afraid to share it. <laughs> Sometimes these coaches even talk earlier in the week, and they'll just straight up tell their counterpart, hey, yeah, we're going to throw this guy. We're going to throw Weber. Uh, and other people keep it closer to the vest and maybe sometimes don't even share it with the team. They just tell everybody, the whole bullpen, hey, be ready at any point we call for you. Whereas other other pitching coaches will, will want the guys to have an idea, say, hey, we're going with guy A first and then it's B next and those sorts of things. Uh, and, and Coach uh, Beasley mentioning to me before the game, you expect to see a lot of guys out of the bullpen today. We have not because Josh Chorman pitched so well for Lynchburg that, that the Hornets haven't needed to go to the bullpen. Never know what you're going to get to. Only second start, as we have mentioned throughout the entire broadcast. But there was never a point in this game where he looked uncomfortable or really like the pressure got to him. And even in that first inning that was a little difficult, he just handled it and moved on. Yeah. That's what you have to do as a baseball player. Perfectly summed up by you as Harding is on board with a walk. And there is two outs for Carson Atkins, who we've been chatting about at length in this game for good reason. Four homers in the last two weeks for Atkins. And now that you've already got a homer, your team is up 13 to 2. I just wonder if Atkins, if he gets a good pitch, might be going all in again, thinking, let me try to hop the fence with another one. Why stop now if you're Carson Atkins? 1 0 count here with two gone in the bottom of the seventh. You have to think if he sees a pitch that he likes, he's going for it. Gonna Put a good move that on back. that one. Yeah, and there's different, there's varying degrees to that concept as well, right? Because you, you don't want to swing out of your shoes necessarily and spin around and corkscrew yourself in the ground. But I think you feel like you've just hit one out. You're on a bit of a heater. You think... You can pump another one over the fence at any point in time, assuming you get a pitch. Now, if you get to two strikes, that might change a bit. The approach might change some there. Two one the count now for Atkins, who I think is clearly seeing it well in this hot streak here. He's hit safely in eight of the last nine. He's got multi-hit games in four of the last eight. Fantastic numbers in the last couple weeks for Carson Atkins. Now he's got himself the hitter's count, 3-1. Yeah, you're thinking knockout shot here. Two outs, too, so I have a feeling he doesn't want any soft contact. He <laughs> wants to hit something pretty far. Carson Atkins coming into the game, the last three games was seven for his last 11. Mm, swing and miss there. Did go for it. Maybe chased a pitch that was a little upstairs, but I think it was still hittable. Carson Atkins has two hits today, so that means he's got five multi-hit games in his last nine. And then I'll try to add up the other totals here in just a second. Let's wait and see what happens here. Full count, payoff pitch coming. Rips this one into the left center gap. It's going to stay in the yard, but it's going to drop in. It's probably going to be two bases for Atkins. They'll throw on him, play at second. Slides in safely, and it's an RBI double for Carson Atkins. The hot streak really continues. Third hit of the ball game. He's a triple shy of the cycle. Don't know if he's going to get a chance for it, but what a day for the nine-hole hitter for Lynchburg. So Harding was off early, full count, two outs, and anything in the gap was really scoring him. Solid work from Atkins there. We talked about it. He wanted to get one far. And now top of the lineup again, Brandon Garcia who's continuing to find success as well. Atkins has got a walk in this one, and I'm going to give you a staggering number here in just a second. Evan, as we watch a pitch here to Brandon Garcia. Carson Atkins, last four games. That's a doubleheader Sunday against Washington and Lee, a win yesterday against Hampton Sydney, and then the game here against CNU. In those four games, Carson Atkins, 10 for 15. 10 for 15 in the last four games. 
Wow. And I can't even get the RBI. And all that. It'll just take me too long to figure those out. But just an incredible heater that Carson Atkins is on right now. If Lynchburg could find a way to schedule somebody for tomorrow, that would be the best thing for Carson Atkins. Keep a bat in his hand at all times, Coach Jones. And they haven't been easy matchups as well. Yeah, Atkins exactly. is coming out to play and hitting 667 for 15 at bats. I mean, like you said, any chance to get him up to the plate, Lucas Jones has taken it. Garcia fouls one back. He's had a pretty good day today. A couple walks, single in his first start since March 11th. And it's a, it's a great shot there of Atkins leading off at second, a grad student, one of those veterans that's been around seems like forever, and the new guy, Brandon Garcia. Missed about a dozen college baseball games under his belt, but one that we are really liking. Looking forward to watching him in years to come. Watching him now, I mean, this is a – Enjoy what you're getting right now from Garcia as he watches the breaking ball miss inside. Freshmen have certainly passed the eye test, but if you're just a fan watching and you aren't familiar with this roster, I don't think that you're going to think that those are freshmen just because of their presence in the lineup, being able to come out and hit consistently. We talked about fielding being just as big of an influence. Really just seems that the Hornets – are in the right spot at the right time. So good defensively, and, and they make the routine plays. They make a few flashy plays as well. And it is that team concept that you got to love, up and down the lineup, all through the roster. You see everybody for Lynchburg in the dugout there, still on the fence, engaged, making a lot of noise. So much fun to watch. Full count for Brandon Garcia with two gone. It's a 14-2 Lynchburg lead. They have maximized the opportunities, taking a bunch of walks, a few hit batsmen in there, and some CNU errors that were untimely as well. I guess we're going to call it a walk. The field umpire uh, signaled to the watch there that I guess the pitcher took too much time. Not an official oh. pitch clock in college as we've seen in the MLB, but can't stand there forever. <laughs> yeah, there, there actually is still in the rule book even before that about how long the pitcher can just hold it on the mound. You, you didn't see it much in the old days. And typically college pitchers, I think, work a little bit quicker than professional pitchers. And again, there's exceptions there, obviously. But um, – we just we see a little bit of everything as we get a swing and miss from Eric Hyatt, who's had an incredible day himself. Uh, basically, a guy who's only started three games this season, and Eric Hyatt delivers when it matters most. I mean, that's the kind of thing that makes this Lynchburg team so special. Yeah, we know about the stars, the Avery Neves, and the guys that have been around, but it's just everybody that gets in there seems to maximize their opportunities and make a big impact. It's happening too often to say it's by chance, too. Just you have to think about what this ball club has been able to do. And we know Lucas Jones is extremely happy with his club right now. But it's still just the midway point of the season. And the experience level that these guys are showing is something that you expect maybe going into May. So it's a great spot for the Hornets. Yeah, they're, they're well oiled right now in the middle of the year. Good sharp breaking ball there will come across. Hyatt has struck out looking. The inning is over, but Lynchburg adds one more on the board. They're on top, 14-2 to two over Christopher Newport here at Fox Field on the campus of the University of Lynchburg. Be ready for anything, okay? Come on, let's go together. Together, let's go. Big round. 
find her down here. Here in the top of the eighth, University of Lynchburg up 14 to two over CNU. As Kyle pointed out during the break, Avery Neves is 0 for three in this one. The All-American for the Hornets. And we're not saying that to shame Neves because he's still had some amazing contributions. Oh, but sure. we're saying that because this Hornet squad has so many people who step up when the moment is big. To think that your th your three hole hitter, your back to back first team All American guy, could be 0 for three in a game against a ranked opponent, and you'd still be up 14 two, is just kind of mind boggling. And again, baseball is a crazy game; those kinds of things happen. But it just speaks to the quality of the ball club here at Lynchburg, the talent that is all around. One guy has an off day; the others step up. And, uh, and you pointed it out. Neves has made an impact. He has scored a run. He's been on twice: a walk and a hit by pitch. Uh, and that does uh, give Neves another interesting stat that I always like to discuss. He has now played 120 games, Evan, for Lynchburg. He's reached base 117 times. So think about that stat. He's played Talk 120 in a Hornet uniform, and he's been on base all but three of them, 117 games. Every game last year, he had a long streak to begin – this year, actually didn't get on in game two against Roanoke, but he's been on every other time somehow, either the hit, walk, or hit by pitch. It's just nuts, really. Talk about efficiency. I mean, the big guys step up in the big moments, but it's really all season long because there are games in your schedule where maybe you're not looking at right away when it comes out, but those are the ones that start to matter, especially with the ODAC being as competitive as it's been this year. Yeah, you look at that schedule, you, you circle some games like Christopher Newport. You know that you got your conference games you're going to be up for. But I think that is another place where Coach Lucas Jones and his staff are so good. They get the guys ready for every single game. They treat every game, not like it's game seven of the World Series, but they're switched on, they're plugged in, they're ready to go all the time. Yeah, you have a few off days in there, you have a few – games where you come out and don't play your best. But for the most part, Lynchburg, just very, very consistent, always ready to go, regardless of opponent. You know they're always ready to go at Fox Field, undefeated at 9-0 at home this season and looking to make that 10-0. And there's some great numbers as far as what Lynchburg has done at home in the last few years. We can run those down here in just a little bit as well. But let's direct our attention back to the diamond. It's... A 2-2 two -two count with nobody away and two on here. So the captains with a chance to perhaps claw back in this game, maybe. Swing and a miss there on the strikeout for out number one. Sam Benedict is gone, K by Alex Gianascoli for Lynchburg. Mentioned it earlier just how the captains have to show some fight at this late stage of the game, and this is one of the parts where you can't pay too much attention to the scoreboard because there's going to be a situation like this later in the season where maybe this game is tied. And we know that it's not because the captains are less talented today. I mean, it's a baseball season. You're going to have matchups go your way and others that don't. So you have to keep your head straight, stay patient in the box, and deliver when it matters. Good off speed there from Gianna Scoli. Yeah, let's talk about him a bit more. I mean, 6-2. Honestly, he looks bigger than that on the mound, doesn't he? He it's, does. Uh, it's, a, it's a long kind of a looping arm action. I like how he comes set sort of behind the hitter right there, and then the ball goes down out of his glove by the hip and then gets into the arm action there. That one misses in the dirt. But I think he's, he's another guy that's got, got a kind of a funky arm action. Looks a little different coming down at you. He only pitched in one inning his junior season, but another guy that you talk to players and coaches about, and they talk about his stuff. They rave about his stuff and how tough he is to hit. Just got to keep it in the zone. Sometimes guys can get too 
sometimes people say too cute, but it's just maybe too fine as far as trying to nip edges and corners when sometimes you're better off just trusting that stuff and trying to throw it right down the middle. There's a miss high for Gianna Scoli, and it is a 3-1 count with one away. Runner still at first and second. There is still some activity in the Lynchburg bullpen, so some more options look to be available. With his pace as well, it's not necessarily that he slows things down, but he really just has control of what's going on on the mound, and I think as a pitcher, that's always going to be important because, like we've said, you're going to have the ball in your hands more than anyone else out on the field. Yeah, even a quarterback in football, yeah, you're taking the snap, but sometimes you're just going to turn around and hand it off, and you almost get a playoff, I guess, if you will. I mean, sure, the center also, I guess, is going to start everything in football, but that's a, a pretty short transition back to the, the quarterback. Then you got a block, but baseball, the action really revolves around that man on the bump there, and there is such a spotlight, and it can it can burn a little too bright sometimes, especially if you don't have your A stuff. But those good pitchers, they, they seem to thrive on being the one in command and in charge. As Gianna Scoli working against a tough hitter here. Full count, one away. Lynchburg's got the infield back, makes sense with the 12-run lead, although I'm sure they take a double play here. Mm, that one just missed. Good spot there from Gianna Scoli. Pitcher's pitch, didn't get the call though. like Ethan Weaver will step in batting 289 for the captains. Bases loaded. Again, it's one of those situations where you got to just ignore the score and go. That's all you can do, certainly if you're the guy in the box anyway. Team-wise, that's a little different. And coaching-wise, the score is going to impact some of your decisions. But, yeah, if you get the call and you get to step up there, might as well take a chance as we see a good hard hack there on a Gianna Scoli fastball that was seeming to get out of the zone. Should be 1-1 one, one with one out here. There are bases loaded for the captains. And you never know, you get a big hit, you get a big inning, all of a sudden you're right back in it. This one looks like it will drop in the left center gap. Neves and Atkins going after it. Atkins cut it off but slipped. He's still got the baseball in his hand. Third runner will come around to score. It's a three RBI double. And just like that, the captains are back in the fight here in the top of the eighth inning. As you mentioned, it looked like Atkins slipped a little bit. You wonder if that third run comes in, if the throw is in a little bit quicker. We know that the warning track can be a little bit of a difficult place for footing. Looks like associate head coach Travis Beasley will make his way out to the mound again, and we may see a new arm. Yep, asking for the ball from Alex Giannascoli. So he's done. We'll get a new pitcher in here for Lynchburg, and it's back to just a nine-run advantage. I say just a nine-run advantage. I mean, it seems to be a pretty safe cushion. But again, you never know what happens in the game of baseball. You know you have a talented captain's lineup, and it's college baseball too. I mean, those metal bats, Evan, you just – no lead is really ever safe. I think no coach in college baseball is ever truly comfortable until the game is over. Not at all. When those bats start to wake up and you have runners on base, good things can happen. We'll Still get a left-hander in. I'm sorry. Still in the top of the eighth, as you said. It's going to be the left-hander on the mound. It will be number 37, Trevor Barnes. Another one of those young guys for Lynchburg that they really, really like. You and Tim LaDuca talked about how the Lynchburg coaching staff, they're great with the player development. They're great at working on the skills, and they're great at the in-game moves, all those things. But in, in addition to all that, they find all these fabulous players. They're excellent recruiters. They're going all over to get guys, not just in the Commonwealth, but anywhere and they seem to be finding a group of young talent 
that is just very, very capable. So they're getting it done not only this season, but the future is so bright for Lynchburg as well. Trevor Barnes, number 37. It'll be appearance number six. He is 1-0 and with a 1.50 earned run average. And here's another great number for Trevor Barnes. Opponents hitting just 100 off the southpaw. He's been solid all season, the freshman out of Collinsville, Virginia. This is a Lynchburg squad. Lots of freshmen in this pitching squad as well, and I think it's something that you see so many of these pitchers. Obviously, we talk about aces like Potts out there, but just to be able to learn from them and then have Beasley as a pitching coach as well, just it's always going to be something that you look not only at coaches but at other players and learn from. Really, the best players find success from modeling what they see. Atkins will come on and make that grab at hip height. Maybe a rare time when Carson Atkins didn't get the perfect read on that one. It looked like he broke back. Off the bat, it's a line drive. That's going to be toughest for the outfielder, but he recovered and made the catch for out number two. So Barnes with one out here. He's recorded one anyway. There's two outs total in the bottom of the eighth. Runner on second. The three RBI double has gotten Christopher Newport back within nine. And uh, Michael Solbach as well working with that pitching staff. He is one that if you ask all the pitchers, uh, he's so great. They learn so much from him. I mean, Solbach's a guy that played eight or nine years of professional baseball, never made it to the big leagues. But you talk about somebody with a wealth of knowledge and, and also a guy that understands what it's like to have that spotlight on you can relate for sure, and you can learn so much. As you as you pointed out, it's uh, it's really a wonderful coaching staff for Lynchburg. Hopefully they can stay together for a long, long time. That's the thing with great coaches, Evan. A lot of time it's hard to keep them around. They move on and become head coaches themselves. Absolutely, and Lynchburg, just having everybody under the same roof we talked about with that coaching staff, but just – it seems like, as we mentioned recruiting, it's one of those things where so many programs across the nation are going to give the same spiel. They're going to have certain things that other programs don't. But with this Lynchburg team and the characteristics of what they've been able to do the last few seasons, it's just a perfect situation because you're talking about competing every single day as throw is going to be a little bit late. But it just seems that the Hornets come out, and it doesn't matter what game it's going to be. They're going to come fight. And you can't really see that from a recruiting standpoint until you've watched this team, but it's something that's ever so impressive. The other aspect to recruiting is Lynchburg is in competition with all these same schools in that area as well. Four Division three teams ranked in the state of Virginia. So there's automatic competition there with those other great programs. And then all around the ODAC as well. And then you get into this thing where you're recruiting against the Division I teams and the, the other schools as well because of the talent that Lynchburg identifies and goes after. Tough play there from Collins. He, he broke on it well and made a good throw on the move, but I, unable to retire the runner at, fir at first, and the fifth run of the game does come across for CNU. Uh, no, he held it third. So, again, it just shows how, how out of the loop I am. It's runners at first and third. It's runners at first and third now. So much goes on on a baseball diamond. There too. is. There it's is. Been, so far, we've seen a lot of action today. <laughs> Interesting stat line, too. As you'll see on your scoreboard, ten hits for both teams, but obviously the run column a little bit different as Barnes will strike him out to end the top of the eighth. Three runs do score for CNU, and it's now a 14-5 ball game. Lynchburg leading by nine, heading to the bottom of the eighth inning at Fox Field. All right, my name is Joshua Carr. I am a senior. I am a theater major as well as a history minor. If I'm walking around over on the crowd side, I always hear 
someone yelling, hey Nat, take our picture, hey Nat, get this, or something, or hey Nat, you got that shot? Like, um, so I'm always like trying to photograph the crowds and my friends calling my name. I think sports at Lynchburg unifies us as a whole, no matter what background we come from, what differences we have, and what experience we've experienced through our lives. It brings us all together and we have one goal, which is to win. As a photographer, I definitely get to capture the emotion and the feel and the atmosphere of what's going on during the games and what's happening in the crowd and with the fans. We have hugely dedicated fans here at Lynchburg. They come out, whether it's rain, snow, sleet, windy, no matter what, like they will come out and support their team and cheer them on. They will sit through anything. <laughs> it's just, it brings us all together as one. We're back here on Fox Field, bottom of the eighth. And the Hornets with a nine run lead. It's been a fun one here, Kyle Haney and Evan Gates taking you through all the action. It's been a lot of fun. I feel like we've gotten off the road a little bit. We've hit the guardrails a couple times. But that's what they're there for. And then, and then we hit the guardrail and we get it back between the lines. And we get straight again as we get Avery Neves trying to step up and add to the Stat line, which is just uh, you could spend all all week getting ready for a game and calculating Avery Neves stats. And there's always some that jump out to different people, as we've talked about. Um, just he's done so much. It's incredible. It's one of those things, too, with Neves. I feel like you could find a new stat every single game that he plays in. Yeah. Between the four areas of the game as well. The only thing he really hasn't done is pitched, but – I don't think he's had to yet, Ooh. and I wouldn't put it uh, yeah. past him. He's got you know a good I mean? arm. He's got an outfield assist this season. Um, so maybe Coach Jones, we can talk him into letting Avery Neves get a mound appearance. It would need to be, I think, in a in a blowout kind of a game, but um, we'll see. Neves does not have a hit today, if I'm if I'm correct, right? I That's the one so. thing he hasn't done today, and he does have a four-game hitting streak coming in. Okay, scratch that. <laughs> Neves is gonna send the single into left field. And he is on board for a third time and does now have a base hit. The hitting streak continues five games in a row for Avery Neves. You wonder if he hurt us. <laughs> Took a nice swing at that to pull it yeah. into the left. Well, if that's all it takes, we just need to remember that uh, for the next game. Uh, Lynchburg's been really good getting the leadoff guy on in this game, Evan. I think it's six for eight from the leadoff hitter today. I'm going to double check it for you, of course. That's a stat that we've seen Lynchburg do that a few times this year, and that's something that's so impressive because your teammates are coming up behind you just with a mindset of trying to drive in those runs, and then obviously Neves on the base pads, he's going to try to steal. Yeah, it just it becomes it. so contagious. It's 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 really fantastic for Lynchburg here, and here comes Benny Bombs. Ben Jones fouls one into the CNU dugout that had. Captain's scattering in every direction, but I think everybody's okay over there. Ben Jones, four doubles, four homers in basically less than a month's work. Got his first start on March 11th. Off-speed pitch that just never got to him. Good action on that change up there. There was one walk by a Lynchburg leadoff hitter, so maybe five for seven with a walk. We're in the bottom of the eighth. Another off speed that Jones just couldn't figure out. He's done on strikes, and there is one away here in the bottom of the eighth inning. It'll be an interesting topic for discussion as we get later in the season, but we've seen so many different looks of, for this lineup, and I think what stands out, we've seen Webster thrown around in different positions. We've seen him second clean up today he's batting eighth and so for Lucas Jones and it really depends on teams that you're facing as well but it'll be interesting to see in May what that decision looks like and you're thinking about that constantly as a coach that's those are the things that keep you up at night 
the different lineup combinations. Who do we start? Who do we go to first off the bench? Who do we go to in specific situations? And obviously the pitchers are the same way. I mean, that's probably 90% of being a major league manager is how you manage that bullpen and the pitching staff. And yeah, you got all your plans, A through B, and A, you know, you're probably down to at least Z. I mean, you got more than 26 plans in your head, but um, you just never know what might happen through the course of a ball game in a season. We do have a pinch hitter in here, Evan. This is Tyner Gravitt, 5'10", 170 pound senior from Highland School. Warrenton, Virginia is the hometown for Gravit. He's got a one-two count with Avery Neves at first and one out. Low fastball called strike three, and now there's two down in the bottom of the eighth inning. Collins will step in, as we said, from Centerville High School. Seen a little bit of everything today. If you're trying to check your list for baseball, we've seen a homer, seen a triple, a few stolen bases here and there, a balk early in this one. And it was a long time ago, but remember Lynchburg turned that nice double play in the first inning. CNU had a couple runners on, 4-6-3 to end the inning. You don't discount how big that was momentum-wise because if you don't make that happen, if you botch that as Collins rips one to short, he'll toss there. If Lynchburg doesn't get that double play in the first inning, CNU scores, the whole flavor and complexion of the game could be completely different. But it's gone mostly the Hornets' way in this one today. We will head to the top of the ninth as Lynchburg looks to close it down and get a win over a ranked opponent. Don't miss the conclusion of this one on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. The biggest thing that I've taken from Westover is probably my interactions with faculty. I started working with Dr. Fryer. He's always available for help and he makes sure that I get to do the experiments and not just be there while he does them. I didn't want to limit myself when I came here to just taking the prereqs for med school. I wanted to get a full, well-rounded education and I definitely found that in the Westover program. It's given me the opportunity to keep playing soccer at a competitive level, um, but also it's given me the ability to be a student and to pursue other activities such as EMS. hundred percent do Westover because it's not something they're going to regret and it's going to be a lot of work, but so is everything else. It's just going to help build their education that they've already had and make them a better person for it. Hi, Mara Willis. A lot of people go to the universities to find something to be a part of while getting their education. And when you come here, when Top of the ninth here at Fox Field. Lynchburg looking to preserve the undefeated record at home this season. Looking to move to 18 and three. They've won four in a row and they've won nine of their last 10. So seems to be all good for the Hornets right now as Matt Cassidy, another freshman on the mound to try to finish it out here for Lynchburg. Kyle Haney and Evan Gates, what a fun day. Full crowd up here in the press box. We got to hear from Tim LaDuke. I had a great time with him yesterday as a bouncing ball goes to Garcia. Here's one of those backhand plays, throws across. Ooh, not in time. Bang, bang at first there. Garcia. Got it in and out of the glove pretty quickly in a strong throw, but again, just goes to show you how tough that backhand play is for a shortstop. Going to get another great look, great shot. Camera work there and mm, close. Still can't tell on the replay. You make the call, fans. That was really tight, and Garcia made about as good a play as he could have, especially going kind of on that back foot, trying to shift your weight forward and deliver the throw. It's going to be extremely close. And honestly, it's one that on the replay, 
the replay sometimes doesn't make it much easier. The good umpires are using the eyes and the ears. You're listening for the ball to hit the mitt and then also the foot to hit the bag. So you're using all the senses there as an umpire. And that is not an easy one for a field umpire. That's about as close as you can get. But there is one on with nobody out for Matt Cassidy now. Heritage High School just a few minutes down the road. Cassidy actually played his high school ball. He'll give up another hit here. Almost the same spot, really, but Garcia was shifted over in double play depth. Uh, Cassidy played in high school for a Lynchburg alum, David Goulden. Very good pitcher here for the Hornets. So, so Lucas Jones maybe can say he's already started a coaching tree here as a guy that he coached, David Goulding, now coaching over at Lucas Jones' alma mater, Heritage High School. It all comes full circle. You may need a chart, actually, to, to chart all that out. It may have been confusing the way I phrased it. And that's really in every sport, too. You see a lot of times as runners will be going, so now on second and third, Speedler scrambles, scrambles over to it. But in any sport, really, in high school, you see a lot of times even if it's not necessarily someone you coached going off, you'll just see college coaches who can go and start looking at the same high school with different athletes a lot of times. Runners move up 90 feet. There's still nobody out. So I don't think, I wouldn't say there's a lot of tension yet here for Lynchburg, but the game is not over. And you can't expect Christopher Newport just to lay down. It's a nine-run lead right now, 14-5 for the Hornets, but nobody out here in the top of the ninth. Cassidy trying to change that. It's a 1-1 count. The right-hander delivers and should get an out here. Ben Jones is back to get the pop-up. Runner did tag, but doesn't go. And now there is one away here in the top of the ninth. Talked about it a little before, but in a perfect situation there, you see runners on second and third. You want to punch out or a pop-up, able to hold those runners. It'll be number 29, Jason Mendler stepping up, left-handed hitter for Christopher Newport. He enters the game with a 200 batting average, one for five so far this season. So possibly a chance to get his numbers jump started. Facing Matt Cassidy, the freshman for Lynchburg. Four games in four days for Lynchburg. I'd say they passed the midterm with flying colors so far. Again, the game is not over yet. Door is not completely closed on Christopher Newport. But it's been a really good stretch of baseball here for Lynchburg. You can go beyond these last four days as well. Hornets playing really good all season long. so tough to judge success for a baseball program because obviously the record will say one thing, but as fans, broadcasters, players, whatever you are, you have to think about how the season has unfolded. And I think for Lynchburg, even with the losses, many of them close, they've been in every game, being able to be undefeated at home, you just like the direction that this team is taking. Absolutely. The, the pitching staff, Nick Matfield's a little banged up. Remember, he was the ODAC Rookie of the Year last year. You and Tim LaDuca brought that up. Matt Field's a little banged up, for, but for the most part, everybody has stayed healthy. Everybody has pitched well. You get Brandon Pond back from injury, which has been huge. You got a great start yesterday from Wesley Arrington in a conference game. Arrington really rising to the occasion there against Hampton Sydney. Uh, Jack Batchmore has been lights out all season long. And these young guys continue to contribute. This one's sent into left center, and there's Avery Neves to run it down for the out. It will bring in one on the sacrifice fly, but the All-American making an impact with a pretty snazzy grab in left center. And now there is two gone in the top of the ninth. Run comes across, so 14-6 now, Lynchburg leading. But Christopher Newport down to their final out. Neves had a pretty big trot for that one, but that's a solid play. You also think about outfielders, too, not necessarily on that particular play, but you have to watch the warning track, know where you are on the field, and still be able to communicate with other outfielders. You see, sometimes that shortstop will come back. 
Solid work from Neves. Yeah, I think college coaches really value those those outfielders that actually played infield in high school. If you can find some guys like that, turn them into outfielders, you love that. It doesn't always happen that way because obviously there's a good chunk of good outfielders in high school that are going to remain outfielders in college. But it's nice to have that athleticism out there. And as you said, the ability to manage all those little situations that are so weird with an outfielder too because you might only have one or two balls a season that you have to go back to the wall to catch or something like that. It, it really isn't like a, an infielder where you're getting a steady diet of ground balls. Here's a ball in the air, and it may be our game. Garcia coming on. Now Jones will call him off, makes the grab at second, and Lynchburg gets the victory. They beat Christopher Newport 14-6. to Hornets still undefeated at home. They moved to 18-3 and on the season. Christopher Newport will move to 24-7. and Lynchburg avenging an earlier loss to the captains back on March 7th. Wow, four wins in four days, Evan. Smooth sailing for Lynchburg. They're back on this field again, scheduled for Saturday. Stay up to date with the uh, Lynchburg sports, all the connections there to find out if we'll get a reschedule because of the rain or if we'll try to play it on Saturday. But, man, what a fun day. It's kind of sad that we have to end it. Absolutely, and like you said, with weather, that's sport of baseball. We're not sure if it'll be Saturday or Sunday, but for a ranked matchup coming into this one from the first inning, really putting it on the captains, you have to like where the Hornets are at, and as we move forward in the season, lots to be happy about if you're a Hornets fan. Major shout out and props to the entire Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network crew. You're getting to see some great replays as we get set to say so long. What a victory. Oh, yeah, Carson Atkins with the homer, greeted by a very enthusiastic Avery Neves there in that one. Pitching staff did the job here, and a great win for the Hornets. We'll end it there. Hope you have a wonderful Wednesday. We're back in action at Fox Field. Game scheduled for Saturday between Lynchburg and Eastern Mennonite. Catch it in person or, as always, on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. <laughs>